test positive at just one university? Are there too many rules? Is it too confusing? Are you being treated unfairly? We're live from Westminster across the UK. You can watch us, Global Player, Twitter and Facebook. Swarbrick on Sunday starts after the news at 10. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at 10 o'clock, Donald Trump's doctors say he isn't out of the woods yet in his brush with coronavirus. In a new video posted to Twitter by the president from hospital, he says he's feeling much better. There's now less than a month to go until the US election. His doctor, Sean Conley, has given the latest medical update. The first week of COVID, and in particular days 7 to 10, are the most critical in determining the likely course of this illness. At this time, the team and I are extremely happy with the progress the president has made. Nigel Farage claims a member of the Trump family has told him they were concerned after he tested positive. The Brexit party leader says he doesn't believe President Trump knew he had it before Thursday night. He's been watching the latest video message posted by the president. He looked pretty good, I thought. But look, the truth of it is, we know with this virus, it's seven to day, ten days in, when you really know whether it's going to bite hard or not. So we're going to find out over the course of the next few days. A government minister here insists local lockdowns are working despite a top scientific advisor claiming there's no evidence they're controlling the spread of COVID-19. Professor Robert Dingwall says we need to look at social behaviour instead. More than a third of the UK population is now facing tougher restrictions, which are rarely lifted as infection rates keep rising. Rising. The mayor of Greater Manchester claims postcode lockdowns seem like the new Hotel California. Once you're in, he says, you can never leave. Local restrictions continue. Andy Burnham says the effectiveness is limited the longer things go on, and it's starting to frustrate people. The government are really in danger of losing the public in the north of England. And actually, if they carry on imposing restrictions on the north without proper support, for the businesses and the, and the employees affected in the north, we will see a winter of levelling down and the north-south divide getting bigger. UK ministers have been pressed to set out what steps are being taken over damaging tariffs imposed by the United States on key Scottish exports. The Scottish Trade Minister, Ivan McKees, highlighted its impact on the economy as well as individual businesses already affected by the pandemic. It's almost a year since the US imposed a 25% duty on Scotch single malt whisky, cheese and cashmere. It's reported Mary Berry is to be made a dame in the delayed Queen's birthday honours list. The Sunday Telegraph claims the 85-year-old has been recognised for six decades of broadcasting and writing. The list this week will also include medical workers, fundraisers and volunteers who've responded during the coronavirus crisis. Weather, heavy rain easing in some areas, staying wet and windy for Wales, Northern Ireland and Southern England this morning. Brighter skies in the north and for much of Scotland where there'll be more scattered showers and a high today of 16 Celsius. From Global's Newsroom, I'm this. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation. Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick, live from Westminster. Just gone 10. Hello, good morning and welcome to the show. This is Swarbrick on Sunday, live here on LBC. I'm Tom Swarbrick. Hope we find you very well this morning. In the next 60 minutes, Cabinet Minister Brandon Lewis will join me live as a virtual Conservative Party conference gets underway. The Home Secretary to tell the party that the asylum system has failed as she vows to renew it. The Labour leader says the Prime Minister has lost control of the virus. Meanwhile, the SNP Westminster leader, Ian Blackford, he will join us in the week that one of his own MPs broke COVID laws. Plus, an exclusive, President Trump's former National Security Advisor General McMaster on Russia, Britain and his old boss's naivety on the world stage. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC. 
Very good morning to you. It's to the president we turn to to start this morning. Nothing to do with his policies or his politics, but all to do with his physical well-being. As you know, taken to hospital over the weekend and with different stories emerging about the true nature of his health. Let's go straight live to the US and speak to Lynn Sweet, who is the Washington bureau chief at the Chicago Sun-Times. Thank you for your time this morning, Lynn. Um, first of all, what is the update uh, regarding the president's health or at least what we understand from the president himself about his own health. Morning to you. Well, the president has said that he's on the upbeat, he's on the upswing, and you would think he's on the off-ramp for just uh, getting out of the hospital, though we have come from a roller coaster day of contradictions on what exactly the state of the president's health was on Saturday. So I would say you take everything at this point with a lot of grains of salt. The, the difficulty is, as we've been seeing over the last 24 hours, on the one hand, President Trump in his video is saying, I'm fit, I'm raring to go, I can feel like I can yes. come out the hospital, one of his doctors said. And yet, astonishingly, the cameras seem to catch Trump's own chief of staff directly contradicting that message. Well, at first, the chief of staff tried to put out a, uh, a background statement, but there were too many reporters there. You know, he made a few pledge to keep his name out of it. But the most important thing is that statement with or without a name was made within minutes of the official White House physician painting a very rosy picture. And then the chief of staff said, well, we're not out of trouble yet. This is serious. We'll have to see what happens, you know, in the next 24 to 48 mm -hmm. hours. And then a short time after that, the timeline that the physician put out that the president actually had a 72 hour timeline when they knew they were possibly in trouble with the infection. Then that was revised to a shorter period because if this longer period were there, it would meant that the president went and did events, including fundraisers where he knew he was infected. But in any case, in either timeline you believe it is clear that the president did not quarantine as soon as he knew that a top assistant had tested positive. Mm. It is sort of amazing that we're talking about something of this importance, not just for the American people, but of course globally. And there are still very contradicting claims about the facts of it. Lynn, thank you so much for your time. Lynn Sweet, Washington bureau chief at the Chicago Sun-Times, with as much detail as we can possibly get about what is going on uh, inside that hospital um, when it comes to President Trump's health. Back here, having recovered from COVID himself, uh, Boris Johnson is now struggling with managing the national response to the coronavirus crisis, particularly when it comes to these local lockdowns. The Prime Minister, once again, struggled for the details when asked about the specific restrictions in certain areas of the country and whether people should follow the guidance they are offered or just use their common sense. The charge against the restrictions are that they are confusing, but the Mayor of Middlesbrough has gone further, calling them, quote, cruel and had refused to implement the restrictions handed down from central government. Andy Preston is the mayor of Middlesbrough and joins me live now. Thank you for coming on the programme this morning. Why do you think these local lockdown restrictions are cruel? Hi, Tom. Um, basically, clearly, the first priority right now for every, all of us is to restrict the spread of the virus. But this crisis, this crisis which was about COVID cases, is now much bigger, right? It's about COVID cases. It's about general physical health, mental health and jobs. And... What we need now is action, restrictions and government interventions that cover all of those things. And what we saw in Middlesbrough on Thursday at almost no notice was basically government action that is only going to deal with the restriction of limiting the virus. It's not going to help jobs. It's going to kill jobs. It's going to severely damage mental health. So, so what we wanted was something much, much more pragmatic, something that would stop the virus but protect jobs and preserve mental health. So well, I was going to ask you, 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 you sorry to interrupt, Andy, but you came up with, you, yeah. you asked the government for, for intervention here. So what was it about the restrictions you asked for versus what they came up with that went beyond what you'd requested? Yeah, so what we'd done, we, 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 we worked really closely with local experts, local data, local news, local knowledge. And we knew that 80% or more of all infections are happening in the home, not just your own, but if you go to a friend's house and you socialise. So what we wanted was a temporary 
uh, restriction on socialising at home, which the government has put in. But we wanted, for example, someone to be able to stand in their garden with a cup of tea and talk to a neighbour. We wanted someone to be able to visit their friend, uh, meet a friend, for a socially distanced coffee in a safe coffee shop, which would preserve jobs and, and allow that human interaction that preserves mental health. But what happened was draconian action, which will stop the virus, but will also stop the hospitality trade, damaging jobs, and it'll damage mental health. We need more intelligent, more pragmatic action. But this is action based on the advice of, of government scientists, of, of experts in epidemiology. You've, you've said that this, this, um, these restrictions were based on factual inaccuracies and a monstrous and frightening lack of communication. <clears throat> This is this is I mean this is really punchy stuff. Uh, you've said that you don't like the restrictions as they're currently implemented, but you're asking people to go along with that. So what are the people in Middlesbrough meant to do when their own mayor is saying to them, "This is monstrous, this is cruel," yet it's the law, so respond? Yeah, I mean obviously, clearly, categorically, for the record, me and you and everybody else has to follow the law, whether we like it or not. We have to follow the law. So that's the first point. The second point is that we have a bunch. Of, of, of local expertise, science, data, experience of our economy and our people and our culture, and that wasn't tapped into. Now, if if the government had talked with us and decided, you know what, we've listened to you, but we're going to go with our plan anyway, then fair enough if we're listened to. But we think the government missed a trick. They've got the hardest job in the world. I, I'm not only a critic, I am a supporter. They've got the hardest job in the world. But they need to work with local expertise and we need to work together and together we can do it so much better. Are you clear what the strategy is now um, for places like places like your own home about how long you're going to be in lockdown for and at what point you would come out of these restrictive measures? No I'm not uh, and that's a concern obviously is that we need to know when we will come out? What are the terms? Where, where, what, yeah. what, what does a successful lockdown look like? And, and nobody seems to know that right now. So, so what I'll be doing is, is, is urging everyone in Middlesbrough to keep wearing masks, keeping a distance, do all the basic stuff that we know, get our infection rate down. And I'll be pushing government to get us out because we, we need to protect jobs. This is about more than just the number of infections. This is about people's lives. Uh, you, I, I ask you that question about strategy, which I'll put to the cabinet minister that we're speaking to in a bit, because it doesn't seem there's a piece in the, the Sunday Times this morning that seems to show where there there isn't a great deal of consistency here. For example, in West Lancashire, there are 137 cases per 100,000. There's no lockdown there. But in Chorley, there are 73 cases per 100,000. How many do you have at the moment in Middlesbrough? Do you happen to know cases per 100,000? So based on the last data I saw yesterday, we had something like 120, and our number has been between 90 and 124 about a week now. Yeah. Uh, I mean, other places that went into lockdown, like Liverpool, I think it's something like 260. Yeah. Um, but but what I'm not going to do is, is, is fight or argue about 120 versus 260. I just think that there is... I mean, Boris Johnson used the phrase whack-a-mole. And, and I think what we've got now is a bunch of moles which are... COVID cases, general physical health, mental health and jobs, they're all popping up. But I think the government is still whacking the COVID cases and ignoring the rest. And we need to find a way of dealing with all of these problems that have come from COVID. And I think we've got, we've got to work together. Councils, central government work together, tap into local expertise for more pragmatic solutions to local problems. Okay. Andy Preston, thank you very much indeed for your time this morning. Andy Preston, the Mayor of Middlesbrough, joining us live on the programme. I mentioned this article in the Sunday Times. It's really interesting. Um, having seen some of the questions that the Prime Minister was asked over the last few days ahead of Conservative Party conference about the areas where these restrictions are brought in and what conditions in those places around the country are like, they've done a comparison and have come to the conclusion, at least the Sunday Times have, that wealthier parts of the country, certainly parts of the country that have as their MPs big name conservative MPs have not got any local lockdown restrictions despite their cases per 100,000 being higher than in other parts of the country that do have local restrictions applied. And I don't know about you, but I'm getting to the point where I'm not sure 
looking at these restrictions and where they're being applied, what it is that is triggering the local restriction, and then what it is that triggers uh, the government to say, OK, well, you've gone past the point where cases have come down now, so you can come out of those restrictions. There are parts of Greater Manchester that have been under local lockdown for nine weeks and where cases are going up. I just wonder if you feel, if you're in a part of the country that has had local restrictions applied, whether you're being treated unfairly, whether you think, as the mayor of, of, of Middlesbrough does, that not only are these cruel, they're based on factual inaccuracies, they are sort of monstrous in the way that they are being applied. And actually, there's a greater sense now where you live that you're just not going to go along with them. You're not clear about why they're being imposed or when you're coming out of them. So you're not going to follow them. 0345 6060973 is the number, 84850 to text. You can tweet at LBC. You'll jump to the top of the queue this morning if you do live in one of those areas that is facing those local restrictions. And I'll put some of those questions too to Brandon Lewis, the Cabinet Minister, uh, when he joins the programme in about half an hour's time. Tom Swarbrick with you. Swarbrick on Sunday. It's 10.15. This is LBC. This is LBC, Swarbrick on Sunday, with Tom Swarbrick, live from Westminster. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Very good morning to you. 10.18 is the time. Tom Swarbrick with you here on LBC. Again, if you live in an area of the country that has seen these local lockdown restrictions put into place, I wonder if you agree with the Mayor of Middlesbrough that they are cruel sort of cruel and unnecessary punishment you feel, particularly as you look at the cases per 100,000 for your part of the country, and they are lower than other areas in London or parts of London or the South more broadly that don't have any restrictions applied. And you're there thinking, well, why do I not get to socialise with members of my family in their house, whereas someone down South with more cases per 100,000 gets to? 0345 6060 973. I mentioned that article that was in the Sunday Times about uh, those discrepancies. I uh, put that to Brandon Lewis, who comes on the programme just after half past. Let's turn to the Sunday Times first of all this morning. Uh, and it's front page. Trump gambles on radical new 
drugs to beat the virus. I mentioned the confusion that is reigning over the true state of the president's health. The paper picks up on that. They've got Sean Conley, the president's doctor, giving a briefing at the Walter Reed Hospital uh, yesterday. But again, uh, difference of opinion, it would seem, over what is the true state of the president's health. And on the front of the Sunday Mirror, a reported question he asked when he tested positive Trump, will I die, he said, uh, when it was found that he was uh, struggling with coronavirus. He referenced a friend who uh, was lost to COVID at the age of 77 in April and said, am I going to die like him? Uh, the Mail, an exclusive uh, for them. Boris's dad broke his mum's nose. The Prime Minister's mother reveals she ended up in hospital as she tells the writer Tom Bauer, I want, to, I want the truth to be known. This is a serialisation of a book. Uh, that one suspects, certainly from that headline, is going to cause some, possibly some upset and some embarrassment for the Johnson family. Uh, the Sunday Express, just how ill is, the, is President Trump? Vital signs, very concerning, but he tweets from hospital bed saying, I am feeling well. That is the question that everybody wants the answer to. And a picture at the top there, the, the royal kids, uh, the princes and princess, asking David Attenborough a fair few questions about wildlife. Uh, you can see a lot of pictures of them on the front pages this morning. Head over to lbc.co.uk, lbc.co.uk, where we're standing by for more updates about Donald Trump's health. He says, I'll be back, Terminator style. Uh, as he gets these treatments for coronavirus, he describes as a like a miracle from God in that Twitter message that was put out a few hours ago. Uh, front page of The Observer, fears grow for Trump's health amid chaos over election plans also on their front page a story will come to just after the news at 11 o'clock johnson has lost control of the pandemic uh, says sakir starmer the labor leader being punchier than he has been before actually about johnson's handling of the coronavirus having said that he wants to be constructive with the prime minister this feels more like out and out criticism of the prime minister's strategy daily star I'm afraid another another fine mess, Stanley, they say. Another picture of the Prime Minister's dad, this time not wearing a mask, although at least he's got it on. It just seems to have <laughs> slipped below his nose and mouth as he waits at an airport. Second time in a week he's been pictured without wearing one. Sunday people, come home to help your hero pals. Harry, General Veterans, plea in letter to the Prince. Once again, royals dominating the front of the Sunday Telegraph. A royal grilling for Sir David is the picture of the uh, three young royals. Trump given oxygen as vital signs concerning. Doctors claim US president is doing very well. Contradicted, of course, though, by White House officials. Um, let's turn to what more we can learn about the president's own health and what signs it is that people are going to be looking for. Professor Callum Semple is Professor of Child Health and Outbreak Medicine at the University of Liverpool. He's also a member of the government's SAGE committee uh, and is speaking to us this morning in a personal capacity. Professor, thank you for coming on the programme this morning. Um, first morning. of all, just on, the pre on President Trump, they're talking about seven to ten days as being uh, where the big questions are asked about the president's health. Does that accord with your understanding of the virus? It, yes, it, do, it, it does. Uh, I have to say my professional registration in the UK is dependent on me not commenting on personal details of anyone not under my care, particularly not anyone <laughs> under my care. Um, but we, we have been doing studies in the UK looking carefully to identify people most at risk of severe disease and at risk of deterioration. And this kind of science is now well recognised and published. And being a man is not good. Being over the age of 50, and then with every additional 10 years, there's an addition, it's quite a steep increase in risk. And if you've got any underlying health problems, uh, that adds additional risk. So yeah, I, th I think there's good reason to be concerned. Let me ask you uh, about back here in Britain um, and the cases that we have seen, 12,000 cases in the last 24 hours, although the Department for Health is saying that's partly because of a, a problem in, in getting those te that test data to the website. What, what are we to take, therefore, of this rise in, of, of 12,000 cases? So it's not just that the absolute number of cases is rising, it's the proportion of positive cases is rising too and that so we need to move away from the idea that it's because we're doing too much testing that's causing this we're also seeing increasing hospital admissions and that's that's probably really what's driving the policy more than absolute case numbers it's the increased number of cases being admitted to hospital and already in the northwest and northeastern yorkshire it's hitting the hospitals quite hard um, we, we've talked about various restrictions that have been imposed around the country. What is your understanding, what is, what is your own professional understanding of the strategy behind saying to some parts of the country you go into local lockdown and others where cases per 100,000 perhaps might be higher, no restrictions for you yet? 
it, this is a really tricky one, and I can't I can't give you a black and white answer on this. My, my understanding is that the, the strategy is is to protect the areas with the large conurbations where you've got high population density, and the pressure is being experienced by the hospitals. But it's deeply frustrating because we've got such a lovely varied landscape in England and you can quite easily have rural pockets which are really untouched whereas uh, a town that might be a few miles away could be heavily touched mm. if you live in that rural area you feel it's unjust that you're being affected but sadly if you've got to have an enforceable uh, an enforceable policy it has to be a blanket policy otherwise people start taking the mick and sort of using the sort of postcode process to say what well, doesn't affect me as much as it affects you so i can go to the pub with my friends I wonder then what you make of uh, the Prime Minister and others, very senior government ministers, saying that we need to live a bit more without fear. We need to be commonsensical and do things properly and follow the guidance, but we need not be fearful. Um, I, I, I slightly differ from this. I, I, I'm over 50. I'm a bit fat. I'm male. <laughs> and I've got, I'll share with you that I, I've got hypertension. I, I do actually fear this. I don't want to catch this. It's a nasty virus. But sure, we, we, we need to move away from perhaps the hysteria, but take responsibility. And if people had engaged and taken a wee bit more responsibility, then we wouldn't be seeing the early rise now that we're seeing. So yes, I agree, it's, it's moving away from fear and hysteria, but at the same time, trying to get people to take it seriously. And that's a really difficult thing to, to balance. Uh, who, who, is, who is it that has been blasé, in your opinion? Okay, I, it's... At the moment, the data, and I'm not, I'm not making this up, data shows that people between the ages of about 20 and 50 who are least invested in adhering to the, reg the regulations because they've, they've realised they're not at risk of severe disease. So it's that age group that um, has, has invested least in adhering to the regulations and consequently spread it most. And as a result, we're seeing a huge excess. I mean, three or four times as many women aged between 20 and 40 being admitted to hospital with severe disease because they're getting increased exposure within the community. So that's women working in retail, uh, hospitality, uh, these kind of environments. And it's because they're getting massive exposure within, within that sector of society that's not washing their hands, not socially distancing and not wearing face masks. But it is possible to have those sectors of society open and, and safe, do you think? Or we open too quickly, it's just not going to be possible? Reopen too quickly, it's not possible, but it is possible, but it's really, really difficult. And the problem is a lot of people are, are treating it very casually, and it, but it is just very difficult. And we've got to get used to understanding that, okay, just because you're wearing a mask doesn't stop you from washing your hands or socially distancing. Um, I mean, I'm really looking forward to spring, better weather, weather we can get outside, hopefully have a vaccine. Mm. I think we will have a vaccine. I'm quite confident that we will have a vaccine. Just, just very, very finally on on your own area of expertise of, of child health, um, is there anything you can give us to reassure parents and teachers that schools are areas that are not seeing a spread in the virus uh, as as retail sectors seem to be? We have got data that schools are less likely than adult work environments. They're not perfect. There's there's never an absolute no that you, you cannot catch it from a child. But the, the data is showing you're probably three or four times more likely to catch it from an adult with an infection than a child. So on balance of risk, it's probably worth keeping the schools open and the, certainly the secondary and the primary schools open and accepting some degree of risk. It becomes harder as you get older to do that. So the, the, the real reassurance, though, is that children themselves are not at risk of severe disease. And that's got to be remembered. If there's one silver lining here, uh, it's that children themselves are safe. Grateful for your time. Thank you so much. Professor Callum Semple, Professor of Child Health and Outbreak Medicine at the University of Liverpool, member of the SAGE Committee. Let's squeeze in a quick call before the news headlines and after which I'll speak to Brandon Lewis, Cabinet Minister. Here's Tina in Putney this morning. Morning, Tina. Good morning, Tom. Um, I was sort of sleeping when you was talking to someone before this gentleman before the break. You were um, sort of sleeping. I'm sorry yeah, to have, I'm was, sorry uh, to have stirred you, <laughs> Tina. <laughs> no, but the conversation was that interesting. I found I found half of it dumb, really. Um, I think you was talking to someone that, that was saying that we want to be able to stand in the garden and have a cup of tea. Yeah. You know. Yep. But listen, 
Tom, we're in the middle of a pandemic. We are very fortunate that we live in a generation where there's not a bomb dropping on our houses at night. We're not in a sweetie shop ordering rosy apples and bonbons. This is a pandemic. If we get told to stay indoors for one year so that this can go away, we've already been through that. Um, you know, stay indoors, it got better. But a lot of people, we Tina, are saying that, as, as you heard from the, the mayor of Lit Middlesbrough, who I'm delighted woke you from your Sunday slumber, um, saying that these, these measures are actually cruel. They go beyond what is necessary. They don't allow people to do commonsensical things in a safe manner. There's just a blanket ban, uh, sort of apparently indiscriminately applied to areas where the case per 100,000 is actually lower than other parts of the country. That's unfair, isn't it? No, no, no. There is no, there is no such thing as unfair. Tom, listen, I have died. No such thing as unfair. I, no, no, no. I have died. I had a heart transplant and I died. I was very fortunate. I'm one of God. the few that's been, that's died and come back to life. And it's only wow. when you've been there, when you've been there and come back, you appreciate life and you will do what you have to do in order to stay alive. When people complain about not being able to have parties and see the person over the road, up the road around the corner, this is ridiculous. All right. Tina, we'll leave it there. I'll let you crack on with your Sunday. Thank you. Wow, she died and came back. Incredible. Tina, thank you very much indeed. 0345 973 is the number, 84850 to text. Is there an unfairness about how this is being done around the country or is Tina's point completely fair that actually, you know what, we're in the middle of a pandemic. As you heard from the professor, it's time we need a bit of that fear still, otherwise people are going to be a bit too blasé. 0345 973 Stay with us. The Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, Conservative MP for Great Yarmouth, Brandon Lewis, will join us after the news headlines, which at 10.31 come from Bill Overton. Donald Trump said he's starting to feel good under treatment for coronavirus, but admits the next few days will be the real test. His doctors say he's not yet out of the woods, but there's been talks of him returning to the White House from a military hospital. One of the government's senior advisers says the science proves local lockdowns aren't working well in bringing down infections. Professor Robert Dingwell reports to the SAGE group. The mayor of Middlesbrough has appealed on this programme for central government and local leaders to work better together. Defending champion and world record holder Bridget Cosguys won the Women's London Marathon, completing the race at St James's Park in just under two hours and 19 minutes. The weather more wind and rain over Wales, Northern Ireland and Southern England. Brighter skies and scattered showers in the north and for Scotland with a high of 16 degrees. This is LBC.
is LBC Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick live from Westminster. Morning to you. 10.35 is the time. Here's Peter in Cheshire on 84850 this morning. Tom, people only ever understand simple messaging and it needs to remain so throughout the pandemic. So wash your hands, wash your face and keep your distance is pretty much all you need to say, is it? Because there, there's plenty of defined rules now from everything to how you get out of the house to getting in the car to, frankly, having casual sex as well. There seem to be all kinds of rules that are imposed upon people in order to drive the virus rate down. 0345 6060 973 is the number. Come to your calls in just a few moments. Let's turn first now to Brandon Lewis, who is the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, Conservative MP for Great Yarmouth. Thank you for coming on the programme this morning, Mr Lewis. Let's start with these local lockdown measures. Um, and a very straightforward question to start with. What is Boris Johnson's strategy for dealing with po increased coronavirus cases? Well, it's very simply to drive down the spread of the virus. And actually, just going to your intro there, Tom, a few moments ago, the, the reality is there is a simple message. A very simple message is for all of us to wash our hands, wear appropriate cover our face and keep good space. But then in specific areas, yes, I would suggest people look at the website, gov.uk, to look at the mm -hmm. specific requirements of their area, which reflect the prevalence of the virus in those specific areas. So in driving down the virus, um, is there a, are we just going to roll from rolling local lockdown to rolling local lockdown, depending on uh, whether or not the virus rates increase? How long are we going to be in that position for? Well, that's something we're going to have to see as we go through, as the Prime Minister himself has said. We're, look, we're, the reality is we're going to have potentially a difficult few months ahead. If we follow the guidelines and the regulations, then we can get on top of this virus. Because obviously, if we can reduce the spread of this virus, the prevalence of the virus, then we can ease the lockdowns and the restrictions in particular areas. As we have seen in Leicester and Luton, where we were able to shift from one position to a, a slightly easier position for people. But you've got mm -hmm. to stay vigilant. And Luton's a good example of this, where we were able to ease back. But then we've seen a bit of a spike again in the numbers because I think it's a reminder we've got to never be complacent and always be very vigilant. But, but uh, there are other parts of the country where that isn't the case. So for Greater Manchester, for example, there's been lockdown measures there for some time, but case numbers are going up again. What is it that the government relies upon to decide that a local lockdown is necessary? Well, the, there's a there's a piece of work, there's an assessment made with the local area, and I've been in COBRA meetings where we've had, for example, the devolved authorities involved in the discussions, but looking at what the Chief Medical Advisors, Public Health England, the NHS Test and Trace team are looking at, they'll look at a range of things in particular areas. So if you take somewhere like Manchester, where at the moment people shouldn't mix in their homes or gardens, that's mm -hmm. the law, we're advising people not to socialise with people you don't live with. But of course, one of the things we have to look at is what is the impact of those restrictions in, in order to assess whether we have to go even further as we have done in for example parts of the northeast and, and what are those range of things indoors. yeah what are those range well, of things because part of this is, is bringing around, the go on sorry, sorry just, Brandon, go on kind of, sorry, I, was, I didn't mean to cut across you there but primarily the, the health teams will be looking at how the virus is spreading where the numbers are now Manchester is still for example seeing a bit of an increase but there's always this this lag of a week or two in terms of how the virus impacts and how the numbers grow and of course as we're testing more we're able to see we've got one of the best testing um, structures now in pretty much in the world and we're testing more than Germany in the Spain world. And like that yeah he's one of the best if you look 320,000 tests were done on the 1st of October we're growing to half a million a day uh, by the end of the month that's a pretty comprehensive test regime and of course the more we test it is the more we're get the test able to understand quickly. where the spread is so on, on just on the local lockdowns again the cases per per hundred thousand are clearly an important indicator why is it that there is no lockdown for instance in west lancashire where there are 137 cases per hundred thousand but places like chorley and weir and lancaster where the numbers are much lower there is well, it, the, what the teams will be doing, I say I'm not I, I'm not on the, the Public Health England team, but one of the things those teams will be looking at is how the virus is spreading, their assessment of what is the impact in those areas. So in my part of the world, in Norfolk, we've had some pressure recently coming off the back of one and now probably two factories that had a, an outbreak mm -hmm. and how that spreads in the community. I think there's a real risk and we've been giving some very strong messaging to people, for example, in Great Yarmouth over the last few days, to be very vigilant and really follow the guidelines because otherwise these numbers will continue to grow and we will see restrictions in areas like that as well.
Do you think, though, it is it is going to be more important as time goes on here, as we live with these sort of rolling different restrictions at various points, to be more open and upfront with the public about what it is that is guiding the decision making here so that people aren't left thinking, well, hang on, my area's uh, fine and I've been hit with a local lockdown and just up the road where they've got loads more cases, they haven't been they haven't been put into restrictive measures. I think actually through the whole period from right at the beginning of the, the spread of the virus, as we started to learn about it before the spring, and before the original lockdown, we've tried to be as transparent as we can be, particularly with figures and statistics like the testing statistics, as even in the last 24 hours, we've highlighted one of the issues we've had there recently in terms of the new numbers and getting those numbers into the system. Um, but actually, as we go forward and are learning more about it, the teams are looking at actually the difference between different areas. So if you've got an area, I would think one of the things the teams will look at, if you're in a very urban, dense area where people are coming together a great deal, then the ability for the virus to spread quickly is far greater than an area that's very rural and spread out. And actually being able to take very quick decisions sometimes is key. We've seen this actually just in Northern Ireland in the last week or so, in the last few days, in fact, with the Northern Ireland exec having to make some very difficult decisions around the Londonderry area because we've seen that spread rise so quickly and to really quite scary numbers. So we've got to be able to have that flexibility for the... And the, the, idea, that these the idea that these measures are, quotes, cruel, to quote the mayor of Middlesbrough. I think he's wrong. Uh, no, I, I might be categorically clear about this. I think the first priority we've got to have, we want people to have freedom. We want people to be able to live as normal and free a life as possible. Because one of these, I'm a conservative, I believe in that sort of freedom. But we've also got to balance this with keeping people healthy and saving lives. And I think to, to be making a comment like that around a virus with this kind of virulence and that can be fatal... I'm afraid I just fundamentally disagree with them. We've got to make, there are some tough decisions. We all have to take some responsibility for what we can do to play our part. And that does come down often to those very basic things, as I say, about washing our hands, wearing a mask where appropriate and keeping good mm. space. Let me ask you about um, one of the things that's being announced at party conference today from the Home Secretary, Priti Patel, who's talking about ripping up the asylum uh, system as it currently stands. She says it's not basically not fit for purpose um, and creating a two-tier system where the presumption is that you are here illegally, that your asylum claim is not going to um, not going to be found to be correct if you've come into the country by boat, if you made that journey across the channel. Is that a fair system to uphold? Well, I don't want to prejudge um, what the Home Secretary is going to outline today. Um, but well, it's in the papers. Say, it's in the papers yeah, via well, an interview with the Home Secretary. So may, I think maybe well, she's already announced Yeah, but it. Tom, you and I both know there's a difference between actually what the Home Secretary will be potentially announcing specifically later today and the the, um, uh, the appraisal of it that is, is assessed and some, some of it being speculation as well in the newspapers. But look, the, we are going to, the Home Secretary is going to be announcing an, a, a review of how we deal with immigration quite widely. And as you know, Tom, in the past, I've been the Minister for Security, covering border security. I've also been an immigration mm -hmm. minister. And there is a real issue that's grown worse and worse over the last few years. We as a country should be hugely proud of everything we do and have done consistently over the years for those in need. We have got, I think, the best record in Europe for the Syrian refugees, for example, and obviously with what we've been doing recently for those who have been um, c coming... Best record on what? On, on, on resettling refugees and asylum seekers from Syria, um, something that started in David Cameron's time and has continued right the way through. But we have also got to be open and honest about the fact that there is a very real and growing issue with criminal gangs who are putting lives at risk, taking treacherous journeys to bring people to this country who can often end up exploited and in modern slavery. And yes, but it, would, that out. but it would seem, but it would seem from what has been announced so far, I take your point about let's wait to the speech, but it would seem from what's being announced so far that if an asylum seeker were to make that journey, the the apparent illegality of dealing with an organised criminal gang to come into this country would, would act, work against them in their asylum claim. How fair is that? If they've got a legal claim to asylum... For, in this country, if they've managed to get here, are they being punished for the work of organised criminal gangs? Well, as I say, you need to wait and see what the specifics are that, that are outlined later today. Somebody who has a legal right and a legal, proper legal route to asylum, we, we as a country, as I say, have got a proud record and we as a Conservative government have got a very proud record. But haven't uh, we removed the ability for but people to claim for asylum in other countries around the world if they want to come to Britain? We've, we've, we've sort of yeah, incentivised people to come to the UK. No, no, actually I disagree with you there, Tom. I think quite the opposite. We've got to be clear with people that they should not be taking these kind of treacherous routes because as soon as we start allowing people to take a treacherous route, believing that if they succeed in taking that route that they can get to a, a different outcome at the end of it without following the proper processes, then we are in effect encouraging 
that treacherous route, which is not fair on them and their families. It also encourages this criminal behaviour. And the criminals who So let's check their asylum claim in country. Let's open up British embassies to offer more routes for people to claim asylum around the world. Well, as I said, I think we do have some of the most generous um, structures for asylum and refugees of pretty much competitive with any country anywhere in the world. And we should be very proud of that. We're a country who's got a long history of that going back over decades, if not arguably centuries of people come to this country. But we've got to make sure that we're doing that in a proper structured way. That's what's only right and fair for the people of the UK and for those who are coming here to be able to get the right support to be able to play a full and proper part in our communities mm. in a legal way. Okay. Brandon Lewis, really grateful for your time. Thank you for coming on the programme. Brandon Lewis, uh, Cabinet Secretary in, for Northern Ireland and Conservative MP for Great Yarmouth. Um, I wonder what you make of some of what Mr Lewis had to say there about the local lockdowns, whether you have been, you are now clear about what it is that is guiding government strategy when it comes to imposing those measures that means it makes it illegal for you to go around to someone else's house. 0345 6060 973. Talking of breaking those laws, uh, we'll speak to Ian Blackford, the leader of the SNP in the House of Commons after one of the SNP's MPs, um, well, she didn't just break them, she completely smashed up uh, COVID laws in getting a train from London to Glasgow, having had a positive test, calls on her to resign as an MP. We'll speak to Ian Blackford in just a few moments. Your calls as well. Swarbrick on Sunday. Tom Swarbrick here, 10.46. Nick Ferrari at breakfast, LBC. As Secretary of State for Housing, Communities and Local Government, Robert Jenrick, you've been in receipt of a letter from a number of different cladding groups. They wrote to you on the 28th of September requesting a meeting. Will that meeting be taking place? Yes. The first priority for us is to get the most dangerous form of cladding off buildings. By the end of this year, the vast majority, all bar a small number, will either have had it removed or will have workers on site in the process of removing it. Nick Ferrari at breakfast, weekday mornings from 7, LBC.
This is LBC Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick. Live from Westminster. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Here's Mary this morning on 84850. Morning to you, Mary. Tom, it's all about the rich areas who have plenty and the poor areas who have nothing, which does reflect... Uh, what the Sunday Times is suggesting this morning uh, about leaked emails reveal that wealthier seats and new Tory strongholds are being spared the harshest restrictions. Brandon Lewis uh, saying that there are all kinds of decisions that are made about which areas go into lockdown and when. Cases per 100,000 clearly uh, part of that. The density of the population clearly part of that. Um, but they are there is a narrative now growing that some areas are being spared local restrictions because of the type of area that it is or who their MP is rather than uh, the the size scientific case behind it. I wonder if, if that is something that you think is is plausible. 0345 6060 973. Come to your calls. Here's Daniel in Newcastle. Hi there, Daniel. Hi, Tom. Um, Hello, so, sir. what I called about um, was the last caller you had on was saying there's no such thing as unfair. And there there is such a thing as unfair. And at the minute, I really think we care more about every death is bad, but I think we care more about a COVID death than any other death. And I will give you an example of someone I know. Their mental health deteriorated mm. so much over this, and they had bipolar, but um, they they deteriorated so much that they had an episode. And at first, I was really trying to get um, the crisis team for the area to help them. And they came round and they helped her originally give her a meds. And then they were like, she's, she's unwell, but we we don't think she needs help. And a couple of weeks ago, or actually, I can't remember now, a few weeks ago probably, they actually took her, they don't call it a mental hospital anymore, but she actually had to be hospitalised yeah. because of how bad her mental and health And do you think, is. Daniel, Daniel, that that is... Um, as a result of the coronavirus restrictions, or is it because of the time that we're living in and the increased stress that that is putting onto people, it, added it to probably, which there is clearly a mental health illness there? It, it was probably the stress of this, but she she lived on her own for three months under lockdown, you know? Yeah, that's who, hard. Who, I mean, oh, I, I hate to think what people that live on their own who have But it's to not, Danny, I, I, I do, I completely take your point, and I, it is incredibly difficult for those people who are in that position. But the, the greatest good seems to be for the greatest number here, that the, the measures are placed on vast swathes of the country with a, a sort of blunt tool, because we need to drive the virus down, because that is ultimately what the health of the nation uh, rests upon. But it's not just mental health that is deteriorating for a lot of people, it's their livelihood. You know, yeah. businesses, well, the hospitality is going to go, a lot is going to go under, you know. Well, listen, Daniel, this is where, yeah, this is where, thank you for the call, by the way. So the line was breaking up slightly. But but this is where, um, the, where the mayor of Middlesbrough comes in with his comments about them being cruel. Um, about them being too harsh, actually, some of these restrictions, not allowing people to use their common sense. Daniel, thank you. 0345 6060 973 is the number if you want to join the programme this morning. 84850 to text. You can tweet at LBC as well. Let's turn to Ian Blackford, leader of the SNP in the House of Commons, MP for Ross, Sky and Lock Arbor. Um, let's talk about common sense first off, Mr Blackford. Thank you for coming on the programme this morning. And when it comes to your own MP and lack of common sense uh, in travelling from London to Glasgow, Glasgow after having had a positive coronavirus test? Well, look, at the end of the day, everybody has got to follow the public health advice and it's really important that there is full confidence in that and there is full observance uh, or with that for absolutely everybody. So there is no excuse and there's certainly no excuse for someone who is a elected official um, who, I have to say, was tested and then travelled down to London yeah. and then got her results and travelled back. Um, it is a set of circumstances that are wholly unacceptable. I don't know why Margaret did what she did and she has to face the consequences of her actions, and I'm afraid to say, and I do it with the absolute sadness and regret, that Margaret has got to stand down from her position as Member of Parliament. She's lost the trust of the people as a consequence of what she's done. And I find it inexplicable because I know how hardworking an MP she is, I know how dedicated and diligent she is, but this is an enormous error mm. of judgment, and it saddens me that there have to be the consequences, and the consequences are quite clear. 
When did you know that she tested positive, first of all? Uh, I, I was informed on Thursday morning. Thursday morning? So this is after the trip yeah. had taken place? Yeah, I, I had no knowledge of any of this until that was the case. Now, that was on the back of a meeting that had taken place between uh, my chief whip and the House authorities. I was informed as to what had happened to the situation. And when did that happen? The information was that beginning to come. That happened on Thursday morning. Uh, well, there was a meeting and the, 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 the timeline was that Margaret went back up to Scotland on Tuesday. She had told us that she had gone back up to Scotland because there was a family member that was unwell. Um, so, of course, that was taken at face value. There was no reason to apply. Mm. Anybody would doubt that. Um, and we understood that on the back of that that she had got a test and had informed her whip late on Wednesday afternoon that she tested positive. So there was no indication that this was in reference to a test a number of days earlier and the fact that she had travelled down to London and back. Uh, so the first, the first moment that anyone in the sort of SNP hierarchy knew about this was on was after she'd returned to uh, to Scotland following the positive test for coronavirus. Yeah, and the assumption having been that she'd returned back to Scotland and had a test. So yeah. what then happened, and this this is important, that the test and trace mechanisms were put into place. And it was on the basis of that that information started to come forward that didn't quite fit with the picture that we'd been led to believe. Mm. And when I was informed so she lied to you. morning... I, I, um, well, look. At the end of the day, the information that we were given wasn't wasn't correct. But let me let me run you through it so everyone's got the full picture. So on Thursday morning, I was told that she uh, had tested positive, and that she had taken that test on Saturday. What I then asked for was the full timeline as to what mm -hmm. had happened so that I could take appropriate action. Now, unfortunately, because it's the nature of these things, I was travelling. I was travelling back up to Scotland. Uh, I arrived back in the Highlands on Thursday afternoon and saw a meeting with Margaret at that point together with my chief whip and then put in, in play uh, the procedures to get Margaret to put out a statement and for me to take the action that I did right. in suspending the whip of the So of were it not for your own travel to Scotland, you could have found out about this earlier. Um, no, but I mean we we had to kind of <laughs> move expeditiously. But once I'd found out, which was mid morning on Thursday, I had to ask the chief whip to speak to Margaret to get the facts of the matter for that to be sent to me. Uh, that arrived actually just as I was as I was boarding the plane. So, um, like at the end of the day, I dealt with things as as as, as quickly as I could, as was my responsibility. Let me just ask you um, away from coronavirus, because in a way you're sort of actually quite powerless to 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 force um, Margaret to to resign as an MP. That's her own decision at the moment. It doesn't look like she is going to. Um, let me ask you about about what the Prime Minister has said this morning regarding the union. So more broadly, um, uh, that he has effectively said that he would refuse another referendum. I, I wonder what you take from that. I just find it remarkable, really. And I would simply say to Boris that he has to act in a way which is democratic. Uh, no one has the right to hold a country and a union against its will. And when the people of Scotland well, voted as we've, they did we've had the will the expressed. Really? Well, I think an awful lot's changed yes. since 2014. Um, we've been taken out of the European Union against our will. Uh, we were told that, of course, we were going to lead the UK, but our views are being ignored. What we've seen over the course of the last few days, and this is crucially important, is that the House of Commons has ran through uh, the Internal Market Bill, which is nothing but a brazen attack on the powers of the Scottish it, Parliament. I, I, All of a sudden... The idea that it's rammed it through is a, is a complete... Uh, it's rammed it through on the basis that democratically elected MPs have voted for it in greater number than voted against it. That's not ramming it through. That's, that's well, how the it fact, works. Well, the fact, the, fact, the fact of the matter is that uh, the vast majority of Scotland's MPs voted against it. Civic Scotland is very much against it. The Scottish Parliament is against it. And one of the things that is really critical within devolution is there's something called the Sewell Convention that Westminster should not legislate without the consent of the devolved administrations. The position that Westminster is in, it is doing that in the teeth of opposition not just from Scotland, but from Wales and Northern Ireland as well. And be very careful and clear as to what Westminster is doing here, because Westminster is giving itself powers over devolved areas, over transport, over health, over education. And that's in the teeth of the fact that people in Scotland in a referendum in 1997 brought in our parliament. And all of a sudden, Westminster Although thinks you, it I mean, one, might, one might be able to make the case that, that the coronavirus has shown uh, devolution in, 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 all its, in all its forms, particularly when it comes comes to the health uh, differences that there are between the nations as a result of the fact that health is devolved. Ian, we have to leave it there. Thank you for your time. Ian Blackford, leader of the SNP in the House of Commons, MP for Ross Sky.
and Lock Harbour. We move on. Coming up after the news at 11 o'clock, Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, much more critical of Boris Johnson now than he has been in the past, saying that Boris Johnson has lost control of the fight against coronavirus. The Labour leader calling for a new government strategy in dealing uh, with the pandemic. He's saying that the number of confirmed cases, whilst rising alarmingly yesterday, means that the serial incompetence of the Prime Minister has been exposed. I wonder if you think the Labour leader has moved from being constructive to just being critical and whether that is fair to be critical of Boris Johnson's response and the government's response in dealing with this or actually whether giving more local lockdowns and more restrictions is unfair particularly when those case for it hasn't been made yet on your radio on global player and play LBC leading Britain's conversation this is LBC From Global's newsroom at 11 o'clock. The government's being asked to listen more closely to local leaders before deciding on lockdown measures that may or may not reduce COVID infections. Liverpool, Warrington, Hartlepool and Middlesbrough are the latest regions to go under stricter measures. One of the government's own sage science advisors has questioned if they work. Andy Preston, the mayor of Middlesbrough, has told Swarbrick on Sunday a united approach is what's needed. If the government had talked with us and decided, you know what, we've listened to you, but we're going to go with our plan anyway. Then fair enough, if we're listened to. But we think the government missed a trick. I am a supporter. They've got the hardest job in the world. But they need to work with local expertise. And we need to work together. And together, we can do it so much better. But Brandon Lewis, the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, has been telling LBC it's essential in this climate to be able to act swiftly. You're in a very urban dense area where people are coming together a great deal, then the ability for the virus to spread quickly is far greater than an area that's very rural and spread out. And actually being able to take very quick decisions sometimes is key. We've seen this actually just in Northern Ireland in the last week or so, in the last few days, in fact, with the Northern Ireland exec having to make some very difficult decisions around the Londonderry area. The medical condition of Donald Trump's continuing to cause speculation. His chief of staff saying he went through a very concerning period on Friday and still faces a critical next two days in his fight against COVID-19. That contrasts with doctors treating the US president who are more optimistic. Lynn Street, Washington bureau chief for the Chicago Sun-Times, has told this programme questions remain about exactly when he knew he was positive. In either timeline, you believe, it is clear that the president did not quarantine as soon as he knew that a top assistant had tested positive. It's reported Cineworld could shut all of its 128 UK and Ireland cinemas, as well as more than 500 in America. The Sunday Times claims Britain's biggest cinema chains told ministers its business has become unviable because of the pandemic and could announce a decision as soon as tomorrow. Defending champion and world record holder Bridget Cosguys won the Women's London Marathon. She completed the race at St James's Park in just under two hours and 19 minutes. Natasha Cockrum took the British title. The race for thousands this year has to be virtual because of the covid restrictions in hampshire fiona diamond will join fellow runners from the holly hill running club taking on their own 26 mile route around gosport five years ago if you'd said to me that when i was age 60 i'd be running a marathon i would have and everybody else i know probably would have just laughed at you but i think if you put your mind to it if you're determined and you believe strongly enough about something i think most people will can surprise themselves as to what they can achieve the weather heavy rain easing in some areas but staying wet and windy for now over wales northern ireland and southern england brighter skies forecast in the north and for much of scotland with more scattered showers and a high today of 16 degrees from global's newsroom i'm below Everton. is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation. Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC.
Very good morning to you. Just gone 11 o'clock. You're listening to Swarbrick on Sunday here on LBC and possibly watching us as well. Available on Global Player, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. The all-out assault on your senses continues this Sunday morning. Thank you for being there with us. Uh, we've got an interview, an exclusive interview with H.R. McMaster, the general who was formerly President Trump's national security advisor. Uh, he tells us about the president's response to the threat from Russia, to North Korea, about the meetings with Kim Jong-un, and what Britain should do when faced with a threat from China. There is plenty that is going on behind the scenes at the moment about Britain's response to uh, Chinese aggression, Chinese threats and Chinese business links as well. We'll hear from General H.R. McMaster about what Trump got right and got wrong in his bid to make the world a safer place. That's coming up a bit later on this hour. I want to start, though, with what the Labour leader has been telling the Observer this morning when it comes to dealing with the threat of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, Boris Johnson, we're told, has lost control of the fight against coronavirus and has no clear strategy for defeating it, uh, according to Sir Keir Starmer, in what the Observer is describing as the most savage attack yet on the government's handling of the pandemic. I think he has, he's has he got a difficult line in this, Keir Starmer, you know, because on the one hand, he talks about being a constructive opposition, about absolutely agreeing that this is a moment of national crisis and therefore the country should be brought together by its politicians where possible. And yet on the other hand, going for him, I mean, really going for him, accuses uh, the Prime Minister of serial incompetence. He says the British people have been let down and left angry and confused by policies that change almost every week. Now, if you were listening a bit earlier uh, to Brandon Lewis, the Secretary of State, trying to make the case for why the government's strategy is the right one and what decisions inform um, the, the health authorities in putting places into local lockdown, is it a surprise that it changes every week as the virus increases or decreases depending on where you are around the country? Is that a legitimate criticism to make? Is it too confused, the rules that we are all living under, that many of you are living uh, under in greater number now? Uh, and is Keir Starmer right to say that the virus response has now lost control of, of getting the numbers down? 0345 973 And when it comes to towing that line carefully between being constructive and being outright critical, where do you think Starmer is on that? Has he got the tone right here in being... Yes, he wants to be constructive, he wants to be helpful, he wants to go along with the right decisions where they are made, but at the same time, he's got to give them a kicking. 0345 6060 973 is the number. Let's speak to Christina Pagel, who is Independent SAGE member and Professor of Operational Research and Director of the UCL Clinical Operational Research Unit. Thank you for coming on the programme this morning. Um, do you think the virus, do you think we have lost control of the virus? Good morning to you. Hi, well... I think we're very much in danger of doing so. We had really rapid increase in cases over September, and then there were really welcome signs that that was slowing down last week. But since you know the end of last week, it's accelerated again, and it is still growing. And if it keeps growing, then we're in trouble. Um, and I think what Keir Starmer's point is, and I think it's right, is that the public has been behaving differently. The recent surveys from Opinion show that, and ONS show that people are going out less are socialising less, we are slowing down the growth, but we've bought ourselves time, but that time has to be used to fix testing and tracing, and they haven't done that. Yep. We heard from um, a, a colleague, a, a SAGE member, who was saying that the group that are causing the virus to spread more now are between the ages of 20 and 50, and it seems that retail sectors are the place where they're seeing a greater degree of transmission. In your opinion, is it possible to have retail open, even in a COVID-secure way, whilst also trying to keep control of the virus? I mean, I think that's where this kind of language of local lockdowns has been quite damaging, because actually everything's open. So nowhere is locked down. We have got restrictions on who we can socialise with, but in a sense, we're not anywhere in the situation where in March, where literally everything was shut. Um, like shops and kind of normal retail haven't been so far big uh, vectors of transmission. But if that is increasing, I mean, it's not surprising. That's where lots of people gather. Anywhere where lots of people mm -hmm. gather is dangerous. And we're now in a situation now the weather's going bad, that everyone's inside and it's more crowded and it and it's easier to transmit. I think we do need to prioritise keeping schools open um, yep. and that might mean making some difficult choices but it'll probably start with pubs and restaurants where people aren't, aren't masked like they're the most dangerous places and, and um simply put why is it that you think that we are in danger of losing control what is it that is ultimately driving that <laughs> the fact that it's spreading um but i you know, I, I understand that but but the, either we're in a position where 
we're still feeling our way to what a new normal looks like, to our ability to live with this thing. Until, you know, manna from heaven is sent in the form of a, a, of a vaccine, we're going to have to live with this. And I just wonder to what extent we are feeling our way through that. Maybe some bits of society are going to have to close down rather more uh, like March than, than they currently are. Or whether there is, uh, you know, people's behaviour that is dri ultimately driving this increase. I mean, with this virus, as long as you have lots of people left to infect, which we do, and most countries do, if it's either going to keep growing or keep shrinking. There isn't this kind of steady level where you can keep it as where it is. So that's kind of as long as it's growing, it's bad. Now, we've slowed it down a lot, and that helps. But what we've seen is that the countries that have really good contact tracing can have almost normal economies. I mean, they, they wear masks and they have some social distancing, but everything's open. They can, they can quickly control new spikes, and we're seeing that mm -hmm. now. Um, in Southeast Asia, but also Italy and Germany have kept a much better lid on it than, say, France and Spain and currently us. So to me, what what makes me worry about losing control is that we are not fixing our testing and tracing system. Like we just had this big issue with the 12,000 cases yesterday where clearly yeah. they lost various tests. I mean, that's just not good enough. You say they lost those tests? Well... I mean, however What's you want to explain it. I mean, I mean, I mean, they basically said, oh, you know, there are all these tests that we didn't report last week. So, I mean, interpret that how you will. But clearly they should have been reporting them last week and they didn't. So it looked like last week, actually, the numbers were artificially low. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder to what extent you think, again, we've got Keir Starmer's five new um, points that the government ought to follow, including, as I, as I mentioned to Brandon Lewis, the idea of publishing the criteria that is used to inform those local restrictions when they're introduced and when they're lifted. Um, when you talk about the strategy being one that can't, that can't have the virus at a certain level, it's either going up or it's coming down, do you think that we're in a strategy that just isn't going to work ultimately until a vaccine comes and who, who knows when that's going to be? Well, I'm not sure we're in a strategy at all. I mean, I think that's the problem is that, is that it's kind of reactive decision making that seems a little bit kind of rushed and, oh my God, it's going up here, we have to do something. It's going up here, we have to do something. And that's why you've ended up with this kind of mishmash of restrictions in really local areas where it's incredibly confusing. So like in Greater Manchester, there are four different restrictions depending on which postcode mm -hmm. you're in. Whereas in Ireland, what they've done is they have five different levels that are at county level, so bigger areas. And they say, right, if it's like this, then you can do this, 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 and this, and then they escalate. And so it's really clear to everybody what the rules are and when they get triggered and when they get eased. And I think that's something that we need, just clearer communication, clear understanding of why we're doing it and where we're going. Okay. Christina, I'm really grateful to you for your time this morning. Thank you very much indeed. Christina Pagel, who is Independent SAGE member, Professor of Operational Research and Director of the UCL Clinical Operational Research Unit. Could they be clearer is the strategy that apparently is held at the moment. And it's not, it's not when, when Brandon Lewis said earlier that the strategy is get the virus down, well, obviously, the question is how you go about doing that and how you communicate that to the public. And it seems at the moment that number 10's hope is that by March, the weather will be better, maybe there's a vaccine, maybe there are better therapeutics and we can start to, to get it down that way too. That's a hell of a gamble. I mean, that it really is a massive gamble because we're, if, if we're in March and the weather's awful still and there is no particular vaccine or there's no way of getting it out to large numbers of people, how does the strategy continue from there? 0345 6060 973, whether you think that indeed we are on the cusp of losing control of the virus and in the face of a test and trace system that is not really world beating in any way uh, these local lockdowns and the rolling from one day you're under these measures to the next day you're under those measures and you're not quite sure as to why that is just going to have to continue uh, indefinitely 0345 6060 973 let's come to Noel in Gloucester this morning hi there Noel Hiya, Tom. Um, oh, I think it doesn't matter who was in power they're stuck between the devil and the deep blue sea and I'll tell you for why I don't think they've ever had hold of it. Because if you let it run rampant and just let um, you know um, let everyone get it by the vulnerable, and you lock the vulnerable up, then even healthy people are getting ill are going to end up in hospital. There's also going to be loads of people out there with underlying health problems they don't even know about yet are going to end up in hospital. The mm. hospitals are going to get absolutely rammed. The vulnerable are going to be stuck at home, not getting treated, and they're going to be passing away. And the whole reason it ain't, it's never going to cope is because of the 10 years of massive cuts to the NHS. It's like a perfect storm. 
So, and 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 you, you, know, you people, seem not to be rather fatalistic about this, though. That that there is just no way of being able to do this better than we're doing it at the moment. Well, they're. <laughs> The only reason they're doing local lockdowns is so that they don't have to come out and say it's a national lockdown. They can, every single area in the whole country can be on local lockdown, but it's not a national lockdown. It's, it's both sides I've, I haven't got a clue, and, and I don't think, you know, they, they will have. I really don't think they will have. It's just simply that, that the NHS cannot cope. So what I think they're doing... But you, again, really, no, but again, you say, but when it comes to the NHS not coping... We saw in March what happens if if there are no lockdown measures and the NHS starts to get overwhelmed. We saw it in northern Italy too. Actually, right now, the NHS does seem to be coping, partly because of the, the measures that are being taken by everybody, you and me, in order not to, to try and spread this thing around. Yes, Tom, but the, but the reason the NHS was coping is because loads of, loads of other serious illnesses have been put on the back burner and people are dying from that. It doesn't matter whether you do one or you do the other. The NHS is, will not cope, so they're bleeding out slowly. That's what I think. Oh, oh. I think they, rather than having it all out in one go, they're trying to slow it down just so the NHS is not just inundated with it. They, they've right. got no choice. There is nothing. Well, no. They listen, can do. I think the the reasons to slow it down might be um, there might be many reasons why it's being slowed down. As you say, for to, for capacity to be built up in the NHS, as we saw over the last few months, for time for potentially for a vaccine to come on board, if scientists can work that out quickly enough, for the test and trace system uh, to catch up with the reality of people trying to go back to normal, and and for those three areas, I think the one that is 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 working at the moment seems to be in the nhs to be honest the test and trace system isn't there yet and who knows where we're going to be with a vaccine thank you for the call 0345 6060973 is the number 84850 to text are we in danger of losing control of this as keir starmer the labor leader suggests or in your view is it a bit of hyperbole from the labor leader come to your thoughts in just a moment plus uh, we'll hear from general hr mcmaster the former national security advisor to president trump an exclusive interview on swarbrick on sunday hr mcmaster about china about russia about the president's foreign policy and about coronavirus his view as the national security advisor formerly to donald trump about whether the virus could have come from a chinese laboratory we'll speak to hr mcmaster in just a few moments tom swarbrick here 11 16. LBC.
This is LBC Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick, live from Westminster. Nobody is interested in what Keir Starmer has got to say, says, says this texter. He was the one that got Labour's policy on Brexit so wrong and lost so many seats in Labour's heartland. Well, he is the Labour leader now and he's got the best chance of anybody of being the next Prime Minister. Um, so I do think it's important what he says. He says that Johnson has lost control of it. 0345 6060 973 is the number. Uh, I want to uh, play you an interview that we recorded a bit earlier in the week here on LBC um, with General H.R. McMaster, who is the former National Security Advisor uh, to President Donald Trump and is author of a new book called Battlegrounds, The Fight to Defend the Free World. Um, we talk a lot about, about coronavirus, about North Korea, about the president's attitude to some of the leaders of those countries. But I started by asking him, after whether four years of President Donald Trump, the world is a safer place. Well, I think in some ways it's safer and some ways it's less safe. It really depends on the particular policies and, and the challenges to the free world that I lay out in the book. There's a, there are a range of, of policies that I think that we have to undertake as matters of urgency. I think, for example, we've all realized the threat of the Chinese Communist Party, and we're competing much more effectively there. But in the case of jihadist terrorists, I think in many ways those terrorist organizations hmm. are more dangerous today, uh, really because they're orders of magnitude larger in scale, they have access to more destructive weapons, and there is this drive now to disengage. Right. So sure. I think that that, that we really it, it, we face a range of challenges, and then. And the response to each of those, I think, is, is different, you know, based on trying to understand those challenges on their own terms and how they affect our vital interests, our security, our prosperity uh, and, and the influence of our free and open societies in the world. So let's get into some of those challenges that you advise the president on and indeed he has been dealing with in office. Uh, you've talked a lot about Russia. You've, you've um, talked a lot about interference in elections. There is no doubt in your mind, is there, that, that Russia interferes in uh, US and UK politics? Right. And European politics and any of our free and open societies, they want to drag us down, right? Vladimir Putin doesn't have a lot going for him. And so he can't compete with us mm. on our own terms. So I think what Putin has in mind is to be the last man standing and right? to, to really polarize us, to yeah. pit communities against each other and to reduce our confidence in our democratic principles and institutions and processes. I wonder how damaging you think that is for democracy. It's very damaging, especially when we're our own worst enemies, right? whenever, whenever we give Putin room to maneuver. And whenever we don't really have civil discussions around mm. around these challenges that that I discuss in the book, and what I'm hoping, I hope in the book, and the discussions we can have around these challenges will help bring us together and make us less vulnerable to Putin's playbook and this sustained campaign of of political warfare, essentially yeah. against. Well, I, w I wonder then what you made with that, with that background, that context of the president standing in Helsinki next to Vladimir Putin and saying, quote, President Putin says it's not Russia. I don't see any reason why it would be when it came to involvement in democracy or meddling in the democratic affairs of the United States. I wonder what you made of that. Well, what I made of it is I can't understand it. Uh, now, I, I had left the job by then, right? So I was, I was, uh, I was actually at Lake Tahoe on, on vacation. Uh, as perplexed as anyone. And, and what's regrettable about those sorts of statements is it gives Putin room, right? So this campaign is one of disruption and disinformation mm. and denial. And if you but th that's the president denial, there. That's the president there seemingly trusting Vladimir Putin's word over his own experts like yourself with a background in this, a history in this, an understanding of this, his own American institutions. I and mean, that must have, you must have been driven mad by that. Well, it was maddening for sure. But what, what I try to do in, in Battlegrounds is, is place that in context of three administrations who had this illusion of better relations with Vladimir Putin. You might recall mm. President, President George W. Bush said he looked into Putin's soul and saw a man who cares deeply about his people. And then, then President Obama you know, said, hey, I want to I will have more flexibility after the election to have a better relationship with you. And Secretary of State Hillary Clinton in the Obama administration brought the reset button, remember, to sure. Geneva. And so, yeah, and they, Trump's they talked all, about bringing him into the bound, G8 as well, yeah. Absolutely. They were all bound to, to be disappointed. 
And I, I think President Trump, if he has a second term, he'll be disappointed too. I wish he would just <laughs> learn from, from the, the, our, even our most recent experience and skip that whole learning process mm. and start at disappointment and, and realize that we have to all work to really parry Putin's playbook. Uh, and, and we can do that in a number of ways. But first and foremost, it's not giving him the space to deny his egregious mm. actions against us. Let's talk about North Korea, again, a subject that you've spoken at length about. Um, you said a couple of years ago, whilst you were in the job, that it posed the biggest threat to the United States and the world, that the chances were fast running out before military action might have to be taken, that the world was running out of, of time, that even to compel them to ditch their nuclear weapons program, military involvement may have to come. I, I wonder if you think the strategy of engagement with Kim Jong-un has been a success? No, it hasn't been a success. I think it was worth trying, though, and I think what's important about it is we were we were determined at the time not to repeat the, the failed patterns of the past, and, and in particular, not to alleviate this maximum pressure campaign until there was irreversible momentum toward denuclearization. Yeah. You know, so why didn't it work? You know, well, it didn't work because we have to at least be open to the possibility that Kim Jong-un wants to keep his nuclear weapons. And so the, this maximum pressure strategy is really testing the thesis, testing the thesis that, uh, that, that Kim Jong Un can be convinced that he's less safe, really, uh, you know, with the weapons than he is without. Mm. Do you, do you think that unfortunately at some stage, unless it can be, he can be persuaded diplomatically or economically that that's the case, that military involvement may have to come? It's a possibility. It would be irresponsible not to prepare for it, but it would also be irresponsible to think it would be anything but a, but a costly and, and disastrous conflict, mm. right? There's no such thing as a surgical strike in war at all, uh, certainly not in, in the North Korea context. So How I, I close think did it come? It, I don't think it came close at all, Tom. I've heard these, these reports and they just yeah. don't resonate with me. You know, I, I, I think it was really our effort to integrate military preparation with diplomatic efforts, which I think it's foolhardy to try to separate the two. And uh, and, and so I think this campaign of maximum pressure um, was, was implemented in a way that was meant to, you know, to integrate what we're preparing for, not trying to, you know, not looking forward to doing, yeah. but preparing for militarily in case diplomacy failed. Do you worry that Trump gave too much ground too early, though, meeting with him, the summits, the, the love letters, the, that there was too much that the U.S. was prepared to offer Kim Jong-un without anything in return? And, and certainly, as we see in the last few months, their nuclear weapons program has apparently increased. I don't think he gave him too much physically, but psychologically. And I think that as, this, as the summits were underway, I think a lot of that pressure was, was alleviated on, for example, the Chinese Communist Party. You know, mm. which stopped, which stopped really enforcing to the degree it should, these unprecedented UN Security Council sanctions on, on North Korea, and I think that's kind of the next step for us, right? We have to, we have to go back to these unprecedented sanctions and put pressure on those who aren't enforcing them with yeah. secondary sanctions. So when it's so, just to combine those two, then North Korea and Russia, I wonder whether it's a for the president, it's a bit of naivety, both with with. Vladimir Putin himself and with the strategy of engagement with Kim Jong-un. Do you think naivety played a role there? Well, I think what he tries to do, which is consistent with kind of negotiation and mediation theory, right? Separate the relationship from the issues you're negotiating. Sometimes that could that works in theory, mm. but I think when you're dealing with Vladimir Putin and Kim Jong-un, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily work. Let's talk about China. Uh, you talk about it a lot in the book. And again, this is something that you've been um, uh, very centered on throughout your time as, as national security advisor and then after. You've talked about competing with China. You've talked about their dominance in tech. You've talked about the debt trap of, of the Belt and Road, co-opting other smaller, poorer nations. I wonder if you look at Europe and you worry that parts of Europe are being co-opted. I'm very worried about it. I think there was this sense of kind of moral equivalency and the belief that, hey, well, any investment's good investment, any economic relationship's a good economic relationship, without recognizing this campaign of the Chinese Communist Party, I was that for alliteration, of co-option, coercion, and concealment, right? Mm. And, and I think now, though, I think everybody's working, waking up to this, that this is not a this is not a competition between the U.S. and China. This is a competition between the free world and a Chinese Communist Party that is really aggressively now exporting this authoritarian, statist, mercantilist model. And, and if we don't confront the aggression of the Chinese Communist Party, the world will be less free, less prosperous mm -hmm. and, and less safe.
Are, are Western-led institutions to combine the, the free world, whether it's the WTO or the UN or NATO, are, are they strong enough to push back against China? They're not strong enough. I think we need strong sovereign states to band together among communities of like-minded nations. And then we need to compete much more aggressively within these international organizations mm. to ensure they're not subverted by the Chinese Communist Party or others who want to turn them against their purpose. Hey, there, there's no prize for membership in any of these organizations. And we have to recognize these organizations are themselves a, a competitive space. Yeah. So it would be, is it worth thinking if you can't come up with a different way of managing, say, the UN Security Council or the United Nations, possibly thinking about throwing China out of it? Well, I don't think that's really an option at this stage to throw them out. But I think what the, the option is to just to compete more effectively within the UN Security Council with the rotating members, for example, as, as well as the permanent members, and then within these organizations themselves. I mean, it, it's it's a travesty that the United States was is the, was the largest donor in global health by orders of magnitude for years and years and to the World Health Organization. And we allowed China to subvert mm. the organization. And so I, I think that its passivity is, is our main enemy, because under these flawed assumptions that underpinned our China strategy, we vacated critical arenas of competition, arenas that the U.S., the U.K., the EU countries, Japan, are just now re-entering. Yeah. I, I'm I'm interested in, in the coronavirus, and we'll come back to that in just a moment, of course. But when it comes to, again, it's a sort of naivety or, a, or a, as you say, talking about taking a bit of a passive role. Um, Britain had, until relatively recently, a so-called golden age with China. We've um, spoken before about Huawei and the involvement that has now been ditched. Uh, China wants to build its own nuclear reactors in Britain in the coming years at, at Bradwell B. Do you think Britain has been too slow in recognising the hostile aims that China has? Yes, <laughs> I, I do. But I think we, I think we all were. And, and I, I think the question to ask when you're, when you're considering, are you going to allow China to build the infrastructure through which all of your data flows? Is it realistic yeah. to expect the Chinese Communist Party to treat your citizens better than they treat their own people? And I nuclear power true. plants? Should we allow no China way. to build reactors here? Yeah. <laughs> No, 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 and, and and I think China is showing that it, that it's hostile uh, to to our free and open societies. I mean, you know, this has been framed oftentimes, Tom, as, a, as like a, it's a U.S.-China problem. Hey, when you're bludgeoning Indian soldiers to death on the Himalayan frontier, when you are extinguishing human freedom and are trying to, at least in Hong Kong, when you're engaged in the biggest land grab in history, if they su succeed in the South China Sea, when you're threatening Taiwan, when you're engaged in a campaign of cultural genocide against against the, the, the Uyghurs in Xinjiang, that's not a US-China mm. problem. That's a free world China problem. Let me ask you about coronavirus just finally. Um, Trump ended the White House pandemic unit that was set up by, by his predecessor. Uh, I wonder if your National Security Council discussed the threat of a pandemic enough? Of course not. I, I think it's clear that, that, that we weren't as prepared as we should have been. There are three key elements that we identified that were critical to pandemic response. The first is stop it right before it becomes a pandemic with global surveillance and then a rapid response to contain it locally. Hey, thanks to the Chinese Communist Party, that didn't work. Mm. The second is to, to, to mobilize a biomedical response. In the United States, you know, we have a federal system. We have we have a combination of public and private health care. We didn't coordinate effectively and we let our supply chains become mm. very fragile and vulnerable based on efficiency over resiliency. So that that's an adjustment we have. To but is that is that a is that a is, is, is that a policy failure then? Is that a failure of the security apparatus of a variety of states including the United States itself? Yeah, in part it is, in part it's also a failure of I think of 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 compensating, not not compensating enough uh, for what made sense from a free market economics perspective, but didn't make sense in in, in connection with preparing mm. for a biomedical emergency. Now, what is going to work is that third area, which is innovate, innovate rapidly to develop therapies, which you're seeing really at breakneck speed and and the vaccine. That's going to be I think historians will look back and say the investments that that the U.S., the U.K. and other nations made mm. on rapid vaccine prototyping and the capacity to manufacture and distribute vaccines quickly. That it's going to pay off. We don't know what the exact timing is, but it will pay off. Let me just ask you very finally, do you think it is plausible to believe that coronavirus may have leaked from a lab in Wuhan? I do. I do. 
and, and I, I think it's plausible. I, I, I don't, uh, you know, I can't lean one with the other. I'm reading everything that you just you're reading on it, but I think it certainly is plausible. It's plausible. Interesting. General H.R. McMaster, former National Security Advisor to President Donald Trump, author of the new book, Battlegrounds, The Fight to Defend the Free World. Get your some of your thoughts on that. We'll speak to Tom Tugendhat in a moment as well, the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee. 0345 973 is my number. Swarbrick on Sunday here on LBC. It's 11.34. News headlines. Bill Overton. The Mayor of Middlesbrough has appealed on this programme for central government and local leaders to work better together in coping with COVID. Boris Johnson said this morning the pandemic's going to be bumpy through to Christmas, but insists it's too early to know if local lockdowns work. Donald Trump said he's already feeling much better after being treated for coronavirus. In a video posted during his hospital stay near Washington, D.C., the U.S. President says he's looking forward to finishing up the election campaign the way it was started. And in sport, defending champion and world record holder Bridget Cosguys won the Women's London Marathon. She completed the race in just under two hours and 19 minutes. The weather, more wind and rain over Wales, Northern Ireland and Southern England. Brighter skies along with scattered showers. In the north and for Scotland, a high of 16 degrees. This is LBC. Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. Swarbrick on Sunday here on LBC. Hope we find you well this morning. I want to pick up on some of what you've just heard with uh, General McMaster there, the interview that I just conducted with him, uh, and get some reaction to it. Let's speak to Tom Tugendhat, who is the chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, chair of the China Research Group of Conservative MPs. Thank you being, uh, for being with us this morning, Tom. Um, Good morning, Tom. Uh, let's let's start on what on what the general said about China and about Britain and China. Very very clear and animated about about his his sort of seeming disgust um, at the idea that China would build a nuclear reactor in Britain. Well, HR has been pretty clear about China for a number of years, actually, and uh, uh, and he was also pretty clear that uh, many countries, including in fact his own, were slow to wake up. 
uh, to the uh, to, to the reality of the Chinese Communist Party and its uh, intent to literally change the world. So uh, I do share quite a lot of his thoughts. He's right as well about uh, China building a nuclear reactor at the moment. The first two are going to be built by uh, a French company, so it's a bit of a different question, just paid for by China. So that's uh, that's not quite the same thing. Mm. But the the, the um, involvement of a Chinese energy company in those two nuclear power plants that are due to come on stream, and you're right, there's there's much more involvement from, from EDF Energy. It, does that not speak to what the general was talking about, a certain naivety about Britain's own response to the Chinese Communist Party, even now, even now when there is still, that there is a hawkishness now around, around China that there wasn't before? Right, well, look, I, I, let's be clear, I wouldn't have signed that contract in the first place, and I objected to it when it came up for review under uh, Prime Minister May. Uh, but the reality is that uh, this contract has now been signed. And the difference, as I say very clearly, is that this does not include Chinese technology. It's mm -hmm. not being built in any way by uh, China. It's being built by a French company, as you rightly say, EDF. And the control system, I think I'm right in saying, is by Siemens, uh, a German company. And so it's actually a, it's, it's a European venture. Uh, there are other criticisms of it that some people may have, but I'm not going to go into those. Uh, but the uh, but the money is Chinese, nothing else. Um, do you think there is a, uh, a, a not just a, in the UK but also around Europe more generally? The general talks about a kind of co-opting of various countries by China through its Belt and Road. We've seen Italy sign a deal relatively recently, a couple of billion pounds worth of, of trade between Italy and China. Do you think China is looking to co-opt various countries in Europe, and how aware of that should Britain be? No, I think uh, that's exactly what's happening. And in fact, uh, Wang Yi, on his recent visit uh, to Europe, Wang Yi, of course, being the Chinese foreign minister, on his recent visit to Europe, was trying to uh, do exactly that and to dampen down criticism. Of course, he rather spoiled his own copybook by uh, threatening the Czech Republic uh, for uh, having the audacity to have any relations with people who Beijing doesn't like, which led to some pretty clear responses from Paris and Berlin. But it's certainly true that the uh, connections between EU member states and indeed European countries in general and China are different. So Hungary is on one side of this, France on another, Italy on one side, Germany and the Czech Republic on another. And this is, this is something that I know that the European Union has been concerned about and many other countries are concerned about. Where do you think Britain should be? in that, in that um, divide, in that relationship. Clear, people talk about being clear-eyed about the relationship, those kind of slightly um, euphemistic terms. In the coming years, we're going to require a, uh, a huge amount of, of trade with all kinds of new areas. Do you think Britain is, is strong enough to push back on, on some of what China might be demanding for trade, but also what it is doing when it comes to human rights? Britain has uh, clearly got interests that relate to cooperating with China, with the working with China. That's beyond question. But they, our interests rely on working with China through uh, a series of rules. We call it the international system. You can call it many different things. And uh, those rules are, broadly speaking, the rules that were established by the GATT and WTO processes, mm -hmm. by the World Bank, by the IMF, by the UN, by the UNHCR. You know, I can run through a whole series of international institutions of many, many different letters that effectively set out the structure for international commerce over the last 70, 80 years. And our interest is to help China to be part of that, absolutely, to ensure, encourage China to play its part as a responsible player, but not to allow China to break the system. And that's why I say, yes, of course we must cooperate with China. It's essential that we cooperate with China. But what's also important is that we make sure that other countries around the world step up and play their part too in supporting that system. And that's why I think we've really got a responsibility to work with countries like Japan and South Korea and India and Indonesia and indeed many in Europe and South America to make sure that we all play mm. our role. Let me just ask you about, finally, about one of the areas that um, stuck out to me most, again, from talking to the general, was, was him saying that he felt it was plausible that coronavirus could have come from a, a Chinese lab, um, I think more accidentally than, than by design. Uh, what say you to the idea that, um, or that there is an international investigation trying to get underway in China, and if China doesn't respond to that or allow investigators in, what should happen? Well, look, I hope very much that China will cooperate, not just because it's in uh, our interest, of course, as the international community, to know 
uh, what has happened, but it's in China's interest too. Um, it's fundamentally in China's interest to make sure that this incident doesn't happen again. Now, I don't know whether this is, uh, you know, an accident in a lab or whether it's, you know... Uh, it's amazing we still don't know. Well, I mean, that speaks to the silence and tyranny of the Chinese Communist Party, I'm afraid. I mean, that is the nature of tyrannical dictatorships, is that they seek silence uh, from their acolytes. And anybody who speaks up tends to end up uh, in very serious trouble, as we learned from various of the doctors uh, in this incident, uh, you know, around the coronavirus incident earlier this year, some of whom ended up in prison and disappearing. disappearing. Tom, really grateful to you. Thank you very much indeed. Tom Tugendhat, who is the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, chair of the China Research Group of Conservative MPs. Let's come to your calls. Here's Simon in Orpington this morning. Hi, Simon. Tom, good morning. And I think um, Boris Johnson has left himself open to attack from Keir Starmer. And given Keir Starmer an ability to uh, gain ground, because he set himself unachievable, unmeasurable goals. This coming in with we're going to defeat a virus... You can't defeat a virus. So whatever he does on that is going to come short. Uh, I think it's right now. I think Keir Starmer has struck a good balance between supporting the government when there was a general consensus behind the total lockdown. But I think that's waning. And now he's, you know, he, he's got his opportunity to get his foot in the door. Um, he's, Keir is right. It is unclear now what we're doing. Um, and I think, you know, Boris could have made a really good job of this if he stuck to what he said when he first sold us lockdown, which was protect the NHS. He did an okay job at that. The Nightingales were built, the defibrillators were put in place. Okay, there were issues around people. PPE, but if just their focus was on that, they probably yeah. could have addressed that. If to me, Simon, it's, together- it's, it, yeah, it's unclear what uh, takes an area into local lockdown and then actually what helps b- bring an area out of local lockdown. If it's just the case numbers, there are some parts of the country where you're left wondering why they're not in a local lockdown already. Totally, but look, how, how can you how can you set yourself to this this case number, the R rate? It's always going to fluctuate. We knew it would go up when schools went back, but that's why this focus should be again on uh, hospitalizations, serious cases, and deaths, not just cases. Um, right. And I think I, I think Boris has brought brought these rules in to try and shift the blame back to um, the people of the country to say that the cases are going up because people aren't following the rules. But again, that's not a good strategy. Um, no, no, it's not one that's going to... Yeah, go on, Simon. Go on. He's made a complete hash of it. I understand. Simon, listen, we're going to have to leave it there for time reasons only. Thank you for the call. 0345 973 is the number. Loads of you want to get on. Come on to more of your calls in just a few moments. We'll also talk to David Davis, former Secretary of State for exiting the European Union about those trade talks in just a few moments' time. Tom Swarbrick here, 1146. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. LBC. Ambassador John Bolton served as National Security Advisor for Donald Trump. How much damage has Donald Trump done to the party? I believe very strongly that the damage can be corrected very quickly. I'm more worried if he gets a second term that the damage he does will be irreparable and would constitute a threat to the Republic, which is why for the first time in my adult life, I'm not going to vote for the Republican nominee for president. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Weekday mornings from 7. LBC.
Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick, live from Westminster on LBC. Very good morning to you. 10 to 12 is the time. We'll talk about the changes that are coming to the asylum system that Priti Patel, the Home Secretary, wants to bring in. She's been talking about it ahead of her speech at Conservative Party conference. We'll speak to David Davis, former Secretary of State for exiting the European Union on Brexit in just a few moments. Let's come to your calls first, though. Here's Susan in Wandsworth. Hiya, Susan. Yes, good morning, Tom. Um, good I'm morning. not going to give anything about my opinion on this because I'm unqualified to do so, as are probably 99% of the world's population. We have who working on a global problem, COVID-19. What we don't seem to have is a task force working locally, and I'm talking now about the UK and any other country who would be interested in doing it. Why do you have to keep knocking, Boris? Why do you have to keep knocking the decisions? Uh, why doesn't the Keith Stam and Boris Johnson get their heads together, together with other leaders and make a task force? Now, you know, several heads are better than we one. We have quite a lot of these tasks. I mean, it's great to get experts in the room, but we have, I mean, whether it's SAGE or whether it's, uh, whether it's the COBRA process or the local resilience forums that are there to try and uh, work out what's going on on the ground. Do we, do we need yeah, more that's local. Well, bureaucracy yeah, that's here? Local. It would stop this knocking of everybody. You know, what would Keith Starmer do if he was in Boris Johnson's shoes? Well, I'll tell you. Uh, well, I'll tell you what he tells us. Anyway, he'd, he'd want to see. He's given five things that he wants to see happen, one of which being something that we were talking to Brandon Lewis about earlier, which is um, greater openness about what it is that is driving the decisions to put parts of the country into local lockdown. Yeah, but, but but how would he do that? You know, it's OK saying he would like to see this, he would like to see that. But how would he actually implement all of those changes? How would he, how would he implement it? You know, and I honestly don't believe that this is, this is such a huge problem. This is like, you know, this is like a meteor... You don't believe it's such a huge Earth. problem? It, it's, a, it's a huge problem, but why can't they get together? Why does, that, does it have to be a constant knocking of someone else? Um, you've got two very big parties... Why can't they get mm -hmm. together? Well, they do seem I, to be fair. The Labour, part, the Labour Party seem to be relatively on board with with much of the the restrict with many of the restrictions as they apply at the moment. But we'll wait and see whether that changes. Susan, thank you. I want to squeeze in Jerry, who's in Whitley Bay this morning. Jerry, hi. Good morning, Tom. Sir, um, to be honest with you, I'm right behind the government. Uh, there's a whole load of myths here. Um, the fact that test, track, and trace doesn't work is just another myth. I, I, Why is I, it a I myth? Some, yeah. Right. Why? In what way? Right. Okay, week 37, there was 18,341 cases found by Test, Track and Trace. Mm -hmm. In that week, uh, Whitty and Balance said that the prevalence was 69,600, or very nearly 70,000. So Test, Track and Trace found 26% of active cases. But they so, say that they need to find 80%. Yes, but what, what I'm saying is they, they found 26%. But the prevalence of the virus at that time was only 0 0.012%, 1 in 900, sure. right? No, I understand that. I, do, I don't understand that, Jerry. The percentage terms, yeah. we're talking about small numbers, but of course exponential yeah. growth means that it could go out of control quite quickly. When it comes yeah. to track and trace, their own measurements uh, for, for, contact, for first contacts and therefore secondary contacts is around 80 to 85%. And for some, quite a few weeks, more than um, they've managed to hit it, they've missed that target. Yes, Tom, but what I'm saying is is that even if they got a 100% success rate on the cases and all the contacts, you'd still only have 26%. So 74% are still out there running around. But that doesn't matter. Well, is that, is, that, is that a failure of test and trace, or is that just well, the reality of what we're trying to deal with? the amount of sampling. This is a sampling problem. Right. To get the, num to get the numbers down, you need to be finding most of the cases. And you can't well, that, and, and, but but Jerry, we're going to talk in circles here. Yeah, we're going to yeah, talk in circles here because one of the things that test and trace does is to try and unmask the spread of the virus in the first place. But it's interesting you're pointing to that ONS study. Jerry, thank you very much indeed I for your call. I want to get to David Davis. Thank you. I want to get to David Davis, former Secretary of State for exiting the European Union, Conservative MP for Holton Price and Howden. Uh, thank you for coming on the programme uh, this morning, Mr Davis. I, I'll ask you about the pandemic in just a moment, but on where we are with Brexit right now, Boris Johnson saying this morning that he thinks there is a trade deal to be done with the EU, but the EU needs to understand Britain demands. Do you think we're demanding too much? No, nowhere near. I mean, the, the uh, union always runs its uh, negotiations like this, runs it down to the last minute, sometimes beyond the last minute. 
Uh, and it's taken from the beginning an unreasonable stance. I mean, its stance is it will not give to Britain what it gave to Canada, what it's given to Japan and so on. Why? You know, we're, we're somebody who... Well, it's argument is geography. That's, it. That's the argument, isn't it? It's just we're too close. <laughs> Well, the, what does the geography do at the moment? Geography means they sell twice as much to us as we do to them. Um, doesn't really favour us terribly much, does it? Uh, so, and, and it doesn't stand up anyway. Uh, we are primarily a service economy, not a hard goods economy, about 80%. Um, and uh, services are not, are not affected by distance. It's much, much more important to the, to the Europeans in terms of their exporting to us. Uh, so it's a bogus argument, basically. Boris Johnson has talked about a deadline of October 15th to get a deal. If you were a betting man, would you put money on a deal coming around on the 15th? No, no, I wouldn't. Um, <laughs> look, I mean, <laughs> see, the, the, the truth is they'll get quite close probably by the 15th, but they, but they won't close it. They, they, they're, not, they're probably not going to close this deal. So he's going us. to have to an extend a deadline, another one. He's going to have to say, well, I put this deadline on it, but he's going to have to extend it then. Well, part, part, what I suspect part of the deal will be, it will be a freezing of current circumstances while they ratify. The issues about, about the, the uh, European states ratifying the deal. Uh, and I don't think that's going to happen by the end of the year. So they're going to have to come up with some sort of freeze. Big deal. I mean, the freeze is zero tariffs, zero, zero, uh, uh, no quotas. Um, so they'll do that. And uh, that's, but oh, no, that's they're going to go. So we won't, we won't come out with a trade deal on the 1st of January, in your view. There might be a period of time where we agree of whatever it is we've agreed up until the point that the trade deal comes in. Yeah, but you have to understand that the trade deal we're playing for is zero tariffs and no quotas. Yep. Um, the bits that the argument's going on about, whether it's fishing or or uh, uh, or trade uh, um, state aid and so on, those things are sort of secondary. They're, they're not day by day to day issues. Uh, they're not secondary in, mm. in importance, but they're but they're not day to day issues. They don't impact on the first of January in a way. Let's say a tariff would do. So, so if we freeze it, it'll be it'll look no different either to where we are now or where we're going to be if we're going to get a trade deal. Uh, let's see if you're right. Just finally on coronavirus, do you understand what the government's strategy is? <laughs> um, uh, well, not really. I mean, the the. I, do you I think, think the government funny. understands what its strategy is? No, I don't think it. I don't think it does. I mean, I look. I think that it was very interesting listening to to some of your uh, listeners taking part in the discussion earlier and the confusion over statistics. Right. The, the hard truth is that unless we get a fast and effective, you, you name the number, 80% effective track and trace system, we're going to end up back in a lockdown, either uh, a near a national lockdown or something quite close to it, big bits of the country lockdown, and therefore serious economic harm. So they've got to get the operations right. It's not the strategy that's the problem, it's the operational capability. Uh, and it is astonishing. You know, in three weeks, uh, Korea got an operational uh, South Korea got an operational track and trace system going. Uh, we have taken six months not to get to where they got to eventually. Um, uh, you know, a number of countries shown us how to do it. We just got to get on on top of this, grip it properly. Do you think Keir Starmer is right to suggest then that Boris Johnson has lost control of this fight? Uh, well, not lost control. It's, it's, it, this is not a black and white thing. Um, but you know, it, it, it's a reasonable argument to say that the government hasn't got on top of it yet. Yes, I think that's probably reasonable. So I wouldn't put it in quite such stark terms as he has. Uh, and you know, what they've done has had some effect. Um, you know, it has brought the R down, uh, the, the, the infamous uh, um, uh, mm -hmm. ratio. But uh, but not enough. And, you know, I mean, w one of the difficulties, so I'm going to go off a slight tangent here, but one of the difficulties with, with British government under all parties, this has been true for 30 years or more, uh, is that Whitehall is bl bloody useless at, uh, at running commercial contracts. The contract with Serco should have been really tough. There should have been penalties. They didn't get 80%. I haven't seen any penalties playing. Uh, they do this too often. Big, comfortable contracts with big, comfortable companies not doing the job properly, and we're seeing it here. 
Sounds like you need to call Dominic Cummings. David, thank you very much for your time. David Davis, former Secretary of State for <laughs> Exiting the European Union, Conservative MP for Holton Price and Howden. Take more of your calls on that after the news at midday. Plus, uh, after which we'll get more of an update on President Trump's health condition, or at least what we think we know about the President's health, given that there are a degree of uh, there is a degree of uncertainty about whether he is in the rudest health he's ever been in, or whether he's really struggling to fight coronavirus. Plus, Pretty Patel, the Home Secretary, completely ripping up rules around asylum as the number of people trying to make their way to this country in boats has increased over the last 12 months or so. The Home Secretary says that she's going to offer a two-tier approach to asylum applications where those people who arrive in this country via that method or via other methods illegally will have the presumption in them, in their case, favoured against them. Do you think that is the right approach to deter people from making that journey? On your radio, on Global Player... And play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at 12 o'clock, the Prime Minister said the coronavirus pandemic is going to be bumpy through to Christmas and potentially beyond that. Boris Johnson's warned it's too early to say whether local lockdowns are effective in bringing down infection rates. There's been criticism of the latest measures imposed on a number of areas in the north of England. Speaking on this programme, the Mayor of Middlesbrough, Andy Preston, has appealed for more focus and the government to work with areas like his. Boris Johnson used the phrase whack-a-mole, and I, and I think what we've got now is a bunch of moles which are COVID cases, general physical health, mental health and jobs. They're all popping up. But I think the government is still whacking the COVID cases and ignoring the rest. The Home Secretary is promising at what she calls the biggest overhaul of our asylum system in decades. In a speech to the Conservative Party conference later, Priti Patel will set out how the government would routinely refuse those who illegally cross the English Channel. Speaking to Swarbrick on Sunday, Government Minister Brandon Lewis said he was proud of our history with asylum seekers, but it needs to change. We should be very proud of that. We're a country who's got a long history of that, going back over decades, if not arguably centuries of people come to this country. But we've got to make sure that we're doing that in a proper, structured way. That's what's only right and fair for the people of the UK and for those who are coming here to be able to get the right support to be able to play a full and proper part in our communities mm. in a legal way. Donald Trump said he's starting to feel much better under treatment for coronavirus, but there have been mixed messages about the US president's condition. His chief of staff said it was very concerning before his admission to hospital. His doctors have been talking about his return to the White House. So Christopher Mayer is a former UK ambassador to the United States. There's a good deal of scepticism about what his private doctor is saying and what he, Trump himself, is saying. It's pretty flagrant even by Trump's standards. But the reason he went to hospital and didn't stay in the White House was he wanted to join the American people and share their suffering and show leadership. This is rubbish. The reason he's in the hospital is because he needs to for medical reasons. The Scottish Conservative Party leader said he's shocked an MP who travelled from London to Glasgow with COVID-19 hasn't resigned. Margaret Ferry is already suspended from the SNP but is refusing to stand down despite being found to have taken the train knowing she was positive. Douglas Ross says her actions are serious and she should go. She has no credibility as a Member of Parliament anymore. People look to MPs to set a standard, to follow the guidelines that MPs themselves have assisted in making. And her actions were irresponsible, they were dangerous, and they have endangered many people she came into contact with. The weather, heavy rain easing, staying wet and windy for now for Wales, Northern Ireland and Southern England, but brighter skies developing in the north and for much of Scotland, where there'll be just scattered showers and a high today of 16 degrees. From Global's Newsroom, I'm Bill Overton. is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation. Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC.
Very good afternoon to you. Four minutes past 12 is the time. Swarbrick on Sunday here on LBC. I'm Tom Swarbrick. Hope we find you well on what, certainly when I left the house this morning, was an incredibly wet, dismal October Sunday afternoon. Um, I, I want to talk in a few moments about President Trump, about his condition in hospital. We'll speak to Simon Marks, our, our editor uh, in Washington, D.C., about the um, Trump's health condition, about whether he is, as some uh, off-the-record briefings suggest, really struggling with this, or whether his doctors are accurate in saying he's never been in, in the rudest of health ever before in his life. Uh, we'll get some more details from Simon Marks. I want to come to, to a problem, though, that seemingly doesn't have a solution, or at least a problem that has lasted so long uh, and yet a solution has yet to be found. This is uh, the case of those people who are making their way to this country in boats from northern France. As you know, this has bedeviled many Home Secretaries for some time, and the current Home Secretary, Priti Patel, is saying today that she is going to sort it, that she is going to rip up current asylum policy and create a two-tier system that means that people are not uh, incentivized to try and make their way to France and therefore over the channel uh, on those dangerous boats and dangerous journeys into the United Kingdom. So Priti Patel has given an interview to the Sunday Times this morning where she talks about a fundamental change of approach, not so much on where asylum applications are processed, but how they are processed. So in this new system, we're led to believe that a legal assumption will be created so that people who use illegal routes to come to Britain will not be granted asylum, while those who use new routes designed to identify the most vulnerable will find it easier. The Home Secretary telling Tim Shipman of the Sunday Times that currently everybody that comes to our country and makes an asylum claim, they are treated the same, irrespective of the route through which they have entered our country. And that simply, she says, isn't right. Uh, our asylum system is effectively allowing international criminality to abuse our system and, shockingly, to elbow the most vulnerable people who need help and support to the side. That is morally indefensible. It is a system that is broken beyond belief, says the Home Secretary. 0345 6060 whether the idea of saying to people who arrive in this country via that method or on the back of lorries or any way uh, you can think of getting into the country that would be described as illegal, whether it is right to say to them, you're not going to get your asylum claim processed, you've got to go somewhere else to do that. 0345 6060 973. Let's turn to David Wood, former Director General of Immigration Enforcement at the Home Office and Chief Executive of Global Secure Accreditation Limited. Thank you for being on the programme this morning, Mr Wood. Um, on the face of it, is this a way of trying to solve this apparently insoluble problem? Good morning. Good, good morning, Tom. Uh, certainly on the face of it, it will make some improvements. I think it'd be quite tricky getting that sort of legislation through Parliament, but it won't resolve all the problems, no. I mean, it will solve some of the problems. I mean, the legal system operates in a way counterintuitively, really, with these uh, with these cases, last minute challenges when there's been previous challenges. And, and, as, and as the Home Secretary opens up routes uh, directly from the camps from uh, surrounding these areas of conflict it would be a far fairer system i think and and, and of course the people come from France are coming from a safe country they are in yeah. a safe country yeah. they can apply for asylum there two questions in one do you think the asylum system is being abused and if so who by Yes, the asylum, well, the asylum system has been abused by economic migrants, who, we, of course, we all have enormous sympathy for, because they come from very poor countries, so that they abuse the system. And there are lawyers who represent uh, uh, some of these asylum seekers who haven't got a viable claim, who also abuse the system with last-minute challenges, continuous challenges, changing their challenges, altering the grounds for which they're making the application to the courts, and the system currently allows that. I mean, yes, just on that, I, I sorry to interrupt, but just on that, I, what I, I have to be honest, I didn't quite realise is that an asylum, let's say the lawyer, could change the grounds on which the asylum seeker is claiming asylum, even at, at any stage through the process, which seems bizarre. Yes, well, they they, they had things on like they they make a they, they make the asylum claim if that's if that's not finding favour with the court or that they lose that appeal, then they appeal again on, on the grounds of there's a family rights established. He's now been in the country a year. He's got a partner, and so there's now family rights being developed. So they make an Article Six application to the courts, and it goes on and on like that. There's multiple applications being made to the courts, and some people have been in the country say six years. Sometimes they're they're caught by immigration enforcement officers, and on the the on the route to the airport, they suddenly claim asylum or their lawyers do on their behalf you can claim asylum at any stage but that again it is on the face of it an abusive use of the system Priti Patel says the asylum system should do what it says on the tin 
It should provide a safe haven for people fleeing persecution, oppression and tyranny. Where can that process to flee um, that persecution, oppression and tyranny happen if not by getting into Britain? Well, there are resettlement schemes that the UK run, of course, with the camps in Jordan and places like that, where individuals are identified and want to come to the UK who are particularly vulnerable, and they are brought to the UK. Uh, the UK bring more of those individuals direct from those camps than any other mm -hmm. European country. So there's that, and I think the Home Secretary is suggesting they'd expand that. But the, 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 I guess the point is, if people are fleeing persecution, then they should they should reach for safety at the first safe country or soon after. Um, if they have, uh, there should be, I guess, a way for those who've got legitimate family here to seek to come to the UK, and there should be routes made available for that. Well, quite. And I, I just wonder whether we're punishing, or, or this, this system, or this plan, as it currently um, looks like, is punishing the wrong bit. If someone makes the journey into this country and has a legitimate asylum claim that they could have made in another safe country, but you know what, they didn't, they're here now, are we really going to say to them, well, regardless of the legality of your asylum claim, we're going to say that you can't because you managed to get in? That's unfair to that person, isn't it? Well, 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 on the face of it, it could be unfair, and, and I, I, I suspect international law will cause the Home Secretary and Parliament difficulties if they were to take that approach. And she hasn't said, I don't think, in her interview with the Sunday Times, nobody would be granted asylum. There just can be a presumption, so it would be a rebuttable presumption, presumably, that such applicant you're talking about could rebut. Uh, and in that way, you're not punishing someone for the actions, the criminal actions of the trafficking gangs that we know operate on, on the other side of the channel? Uh, no, no, you're not. But of course, the, the criminal gangs, of course, are, are you know making a great deal of profit on the misery of these individuals who are put to risk going across the channel. So things, but, but there's still inherent problems. Even once you you decide, okay, that person's not going to be granted asylum. I mean, the Home Secretary suggests there'd be legislation to remove those people back to France. Well, we can't legislate for that. The French have to agree for it, to it, quite frankly. So I'm not sure that'll work. And and then if we've got to try to remove them back to their home country, that's the big problem. You'll see there's 40,000 backlog of asylum seekers at the moment who mm. are not who have been failed in their claim and are still in the UK because they cannot be removed. So that problem doesn't get solved by the Home Secretary's solution, although some of the legal problems could get resolved if, that's, if that legislation was successful. Good to talk to you. David Wood, thank you for your time. Your former Director General of Immigration Enforcement at the Home Office, Chief Executive of Global Secure Accreditation Limited. Uh, coming up to 12 minutes past 12, Professor Brian Bell joins us, Chair of the Migration Advisory Committee and Professor of Economics at King's Business School. Uh, I, I actually know we're going to speak to him a bit later, are we? Yeah. OK, Professor Bell, hang on the line, sir. We'll speak to you in a few moments' time. Uh, I'm interested in the idea of, of what it is can be done to try and stop so many people making that journey and those numbers are increasing all the time and it is of course a journey that is incredibly dangerous unfortunately we have seen a number of people die trying to make that that journey across from northern france into the united kingdom uh, pretty patel saying well we're going to get a grip to, w on it now uh, under the changes that are coming in uh, she says in in talking about where people can be housed which is an issue that we've seen talked about a lot over the last week in different briefings from different parts of government um whitehall sources are saying this morning that a disused prison on the Isle of Wight could be used to house people who come into this country and accommodation at a naval base in Gosport in Hampshire seemed to be more likely than any island in the South Atlantic, many thousands of miles away, that we were uh, hearing could be used to house people who do get found as having come into this country illegally. I wonder whether you think there is a, a difficult balance here between being seen to be an open, fair, welcoming nation, but also tougher on those people, or rather tougher on the system, because tougher on the people's harder. I don't know whether people come into this country saying, right, hands up, I'm going to abuse the asylum system here. Actually, it is, it is done by others who, whilst they may say they have the best interest of people at heart, there are clearly conditions that allow further challenges to that person's deportation. If someone's here for a year and they start a family or they've got loved ones now because they've met people and what have you, then, then legally they have a claim. But should they have been allowed to be in that position in the first place? I wonder whether you think we've been too light touch and actually a, 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 a fairer, tougher, in that sense, policy is is actually what the British 
people require in order to have confidence that this system really works. 0345 6060 973 or are any changes in this area, changes that would see perhaps a presumption placed on those people who uh, arrive in this country in those routes, uh, a presumption that they are not allowed to be here legally and they're going to be sent back. To your mind, that's too tough. That's too difficult. We don't need that. Um, that is um, upsetting the long-held tradition that this country has had uh, of being a welcoming and open nation. 0345 6060 973. You can speak. Uh, you, can, you can text us on 84850. You can tweet at LBC as well. We will speak to Professor Brian Bell a little bit later in the programme. And Simon Marks will join us too, our Washington correspondent, on the state of the president's health. No new update in, in the last few hours, but presumably because he's been sleeping. Uh, the president uh, putting out a video uh, suggesting that he was in good health, that he um, was, was ill and had been taken from the White House to hospital, but now he felt much better, praising the doctors, talking about the therapeutics that are coming online. Miracle workers, he suggested. We'll speak to Simon for an update in the next few moments. Tom Swarbrick here, Swarbrick on Sunday, 12.15. This is LBC. Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. 12.17 is the time. Very good afternoon to you. The Home Secretary saying we want to create new safe and legal routes for those people that are fleeing persecution and oppression, but that in its own right sends the signal out that we will not make your claim admissible if you are trying to come through illegal routes. 0345 6060 973 if you think that the new approach to those who are trying to make that journey from northern France into the UK is needed and whether the approach should be to just well, on the face of it, reject their claims, even if they make it to these shores. 0345 6060 973. Let's turn to Professor Brian Bell, who is chair of the Migration Advisory Committee and Professor of Economics at King's Business School. Uh, I'll, I'll come on to the, what the Home Secretary is saying about asylum policy in just a moment, Professor. But, but your um, committee put out a report earlier on in the week about the vacancies in the UK workforce that require immigration. What percentage of jobs in the UK need uh, immigration in order to have those those jobs filled? 
Uh, so we suggested that of all the jobs that are eligible for the new visa system from January the 1st, about 21% of the jobs that are eligible are going to be on what's called the shortage occupation list, suggesting that there are shortages that need to be filled. Why do those shortages exist? Um, I think a lot of it's a long-term problem with our education and training system that we're we haven't got a great track record of uh, working out where vacant, where shortages are going to be in the future and making sure our training system adapts to that. You know, I think Germany has a much better experience of doing that. Um, and what kind of jobs are we talking about here? I saw in the week it was it was bricklayers and butchers and welders. Yeah, it's, it's actually very varied. So they're, they're examples, but it's also senior care workers. It's quite a lot of health occupations, perhaps unsurprisingly quite a lot of IT jobs, which perhaps are kind of new jobs that are being created that perhaps it was impossible to guess that they were going to uh, be needed in the future. Uh, but as you say, it's also fairly traditional jobs like welding, which, you know, it's, it's disturbing that there's a shortage in that since we've known about welding for decades. Yes, you say disturbing. I wonder what you would say to uh, someone listening who says, well, why can't, why can't these jobs filled by, be filled by people who are out of work as a result of the pandemic, um, who may or may not have the skills? Why, why do we have to look overseas? Well, it's actually that final bit that's crucial. It's whether you've got the skills or not. If you're a welding company looking to employ a new welder, it's literally not very interesting to know that Pizza Hut are laying off some workers because they won't be able to become instant welders. Now, of course, there are two elements to that. One is that, of course, firms will want to employ British workers where they can. It's much cheaper to employ a British worker than to have to pay all the fees and the expenses of getting a migrant worker. So if there are unemployed welders out there, we'd expect that to be the first port of call. But we'd also um, want the training... Pro I was just saying, we'd also want the training sorry. programs to be kicked in now to say, let's retrain those workers who are losing jobs for these kind of occupations. Lots of people complain about in certain areas of work, certain occupations, it's actually, it, it's cheaper to bring in work from overseas. You can pay them less than you would have to pay a, a British worker. And that's where people say they see their wages being undercut and why, partly why, um, there's been such a big debate about immigration over the last few years. Do you see that in, in your studies? Well, so on average, we find that it actually immigration hasn't led to lower wages across the UK economy. But the new system that's going to be introduced in January the 1st, we've explicitly tried to prevent that by um, having thresholds for wages that have to be paid. Essentially, employers won't be able to bring in migrants from overseas to undercut current workers. There's a, a salary threshold they need to make, and it will almost always be better to employ a British worker than to pay the additional fees needed to bring in a migrant. And remind us of that threshold. £25,600 a year. So for a lot of people in, in certain types of work who aren't going to be paid that amount, it's from January the 1st, it is going to be up to British companies or, or companies in Britain to employ uh, people in this country in those roles because it's, it's ultimately they're not going to be able to get the, wor the work in from overseas. That's right, yeah. That's a big risk for them. A big risk for... First. For those companies, if they haven't, if they have, yeah, if they haven't got the skills there, if British people don't have the skills, <laughs> these jobs are going to go unfilled. Well, so in the short term, that may be true. But actually, what we want is to essentially we want to create an environment in which firms are encouraged to train and upskill British workers. Um, if there's a continuous, as there has been under free movement, a very easy supply of European workers, that doesn't incentivise firms very strongly to do the training and the upskilling that's needed. So there is a change coming, it's undoubtedly true, uh, where in some sense going back to where we were in uh, the late 90s in terms of uh, immigration. So, you know, firms have seen this before. Mm. Um, and do you think that will restore, and I guess this is probably quite hard to measure, but do you think that will, those changes will restore trust in the immigration system that seems to have fallen away? Um, I think partly. I think that the fact that there is um, more, uh, perhaps a stronger sense of control that the government will decide, um, certainly on the work route, which which immigrants and what type of occupations are uh, needed in the UK will, in a sense, do that. Although I think an awful lot of this is not actually about the overall policy; it's how it's implemented. So I think the implementation mm -hmm. of policy is just as important as the overall um, framework in terms of actually whether people have trust in the system or not. Um, let me ask you just briefly about the um, the asylum changes that Priti Patel seeks to bring in. Um, what is your view of a two-tier system where the presumption is if you come into this country illegally, really sorry, but your asylum claim is not going to find any, any uh, good ground here? 
Well, so I, I think it's important to note that the Migration Advisory Committee hasn't been asked any of the uh, yeah. uh, to advise on any of this. Um, I mean, as I understand the um, our international legal obligations, whether you enter the country illegally is not actually very relevant. What matters is whether you have a valid asylum claim. And as I understand it, we have to treat all asylum, as soon as someone claims asylum in this country, we have to treat them in accordance with international law. And the only other thing I would say is that the Home Secretary is very clearly on record as saying how important it is to learn the lessons of the Windrush generation. And I think one of the crucial lessons we learned from that, that scandal was that we must treat migrants with respect and dignity. That doesn't necessarily mean we don't need to be tough and kind of have very clear policies in place. But I think we should always remember that important role of treating asylum seekers mm. and all migrants with respect and dignity. The, um, uh, do you think p- perhaps that this, this potential change falls foul of that? Uh, no, not necessarily. I mean, I, it's impossible to judge because, as I understand it, Priti Patel hasn't said anything yet. Uh, these are. Yeah, well, she said she, she might... said enough. She said enough to the Sunday Times. I have to say, the well, possi- quotes are from her. <laughs> possibly, but she hasn't said anything to the Migration Advisory Committee, so I can't really no, comment okay, on fair that. Enough. Um, <laughs> Well, let me ask you then about the the legality point, um, which is an interesting one that I was trying to tease out of the cabinet minister a little earlier in in the programme. What illegality are we judging against here? Are we judging it against the the use of organised criminality in coming across uh, the English Channel or the jumping on the back of the ferry? uh, And and if so, why are we punishing something that could be perfectly legal, i.e. the asylum claim, for something that was done illegally before? That's That's not really the way it should work. Well, again, as as I understand the law, and I'm not a lawyer, but as I understand it, um, it doesn't matter particularly how you get into this country. If if you claim asylum as soon as you enter this country, we are under a legal obligation Mm. to deal with that asylum claim, irrespective of how you entered. I think where we do want to be very tough is on the kind of the people smugglers and the like who are making enormous profits potentially from aiding these um, asylum seekers to get into the UK. That's just a clearly illegal activity. It's nothing to do with asylum. It's just yeah. illegal smuggling. And that's where, you know, there's very clear action needed. Just very, very finally, and, and rather confusingly, to go back to where we started, <laughs> when I asked you about what percentage of, of jobs in the workforce are going to be on this shortage list, I think you said 20-odd 20, 20 percent. Um, how does that compare to Spain or France or Italy or Germany? Uh, well, in some sense, it doesn't, for the simple reason that, uh, of course, they're all remaining in the European Union. So most of these <laughs> countries, most of these countries, don't have a shortage occupation list because there's because of freedom of movement. They have a, a pool of workers of half a billion to uh, select from. We, we need the shortage occupation list because we're leaving the European Union, mm. and so we won't be having the same freedom of access. Professor Brian Bell, great to speak to you. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Chair of the Migration Advisory Committee, Professor of Economics at King's Business School. 0345 6060973 is the number. Uh, Pat in Brentwood, Tom, no housing, struggling NHS, no GAP appointments, no school places, etc. We are full up. My quality of life is worse because of people draining our money, says Pat. I I think the the broad economics of that don't seem to match... Pat, your sentiment there, as you were hearing from Professor Bell, wages are driven up uh, on average by uh, immigration to this country. There are various parts of the economy where that clearly isn't the case and where I think maybe actually public sentiment has, has uh, and public mistrust of the system um, has, has demanded some of the changes that perhaps the Home Secretary is going to be making. Uh, Marvin on Twitter, at LBC, Tom, when was the last time that someone died in the channel? They are escorted from the French shores onto the human rights boats of this asinine, rotten country, safe and well for a life of sheer luxury without putting a penny into the system. Well, there's a difference, Marvin, between sheer luxury and being housed, as I see that Whitehall sources are suggesting, in a disused prison on the Isle of Wight. Now, I don't know what your your view of luxury is, but mine is not living and sitting in a disused prison on the Isle of Wight. No disrespect to the Isle of Wight. It's more a view of dif- disused prisons, to be honest. 0345 973 I often see it's the case that those people who are most against any sort of immigration into this country, let alone um, ones that are sort of stratified and defined, people who are against any kind of further immigration into this country are those who have a really h- horrific view of Britain. It's really interesting that those who are perhaps the least, what might be described as patriotic, are the ones who say, well, we've got nothing to offer. Look how awful this country is. No housing, no GPs, school places, blah, blah, blah. 
those are not problems caused by people coming into the country. If you want to see more houses built, that's what the government ought to be doing. If you want to see more school places, let's see more schools built. If you want to see more uh, GP appointments, let's train up more GPs and have more GP surgeries. 0345 6060 973 is the number. And when it comes specifically to people trying to make their way uh, across the channel, uh, how do you deter those from making that journey, who, who want to make that journey, from doing it? I wonder whether there's going to come a point where we say you can make your asylum claim to stay in this country and it can be tested, but you have to go through this route, that route and this route. And if you don't, then you can't have it tested at all. Is that fair even if the claim is legal? Even if there is somebody who is somewhere on the in the world who has a genuine legal claim to come to this country, a legal right to come to this country, and because of the manner in which they've gone about doing it, we've said no. 0345 6060 973. We'll get an update on President Trump's condition in a few moments' time. Simon Marks will join us live from Washington. You're listening to Tom Swarbrick here on LBC. Swarbrick on Sunday. It is fast approaching 12.30. News headlines. Tim Humphrey. Boris Johnson says he's working flat out to make Christmas as normal as possible, but he's warned of a tough winter in the battle against coronavirus. He says people should behave fearlessly, but with common sense, as the UK struggles to both contain the virus and keep the economy going. The mayor of Middlesbrough has told this programme he wants central government and local leaders to work better together in coping with Covid. Donald Trump's chief of staff says the president went through a very concerning period on Friday and faces a critical next two days in his fight against COVID-19. But Mr Trump himself says he's starting to feel good in a video message posted from hospital. The Home Secretary will promise what she's calling the biggest overhaul of our asylum system in decades on day two at the Conservative Party conference. Priti Patel is expected to say the government would routinely refuse migrants who illegally cross the English Channel. The weather, more wind and rain over Wales, Northern Ireland and Southern England, brighter skies and scattered showers in the north and for Scotland and a high of 16. LBC. This is LBC Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick live from Westminster. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. 
Afternoon to you, 12.33 is the time. Here's Steve on 84850. Tom, why are we now attacking the migrant system as soon as the NHS COVID-19 crisis is no longer critical? I don't think it's no longer critical, Steve, to be honest with you. Um, and I'm not sure that people are attacking the system. I wonder whether this is an attempt by Priti Patel to make it fairer, or at least have a, a, a much more of a degree of public support. Whether it works or not is another matter. Uh, here's Michael in Southgate. Hi, Michael. Oh, hello. Thanks for taking my call, Tom. Thanks no very problem, much. Sir. Very contentious subject, isn't it? Immigration, just a bit. Um, can be. Can I tell you about last year, I went to two refugee camps in Calais, and the, the first, well, there's the, there are two, basically, I went through. One's the Serengat one. It's in, and it basically, it's very underfunded. It's essentially, there's a, a kind of, basically, it's like, um, like a disused warehouse almost, yeah. full of things that people have donated, the sort of things you might see in a charity shop, but not very good quality things. But people are doing their best with very low amounts of, obviously very low funding. And they basically distribute food and things like that on, into yep. a kind of place, a bit like a sports field where these people are living in the open. And that's that one. Now, the one I want to talk to you about, which is more interesting, is the one that's run by the Catholic Church, with involvement of American, emb American um, embassies, American universities. Now, most of the refugees are relatively young people. They're people, you know, the people in their 40s, you know, who've made that kind of trip. You have to be, and there are a lot of children as well. Yep. What, when you go to the American one, well, not the American one, it's, it's basically in a, in a kind of convent sort of set up. Okay. First of all, it's a building and it's warm and it's got, you go in, and it's like walking into a university, you go in, there are people playing chess, there are people playing, playing um, cards, there are lessons going on in IT, lots of these people, and what's happening is, what it looked like, um, well, there was involvement from, from American universities as well, and it looked like what the Americans were doing, I think very wisely, is they're actually looking for talented people coming from Syria. Now, well, what do you say, Michael, to the idea that that is a draw, that is a draw for people? It is, it is incentivising people to make the journey yeah. to the, the yes. northern French border and then possibly beyond. Yeah. OK, well, I'll tell you what I do think. The fact is that the demographics for us means that we really ought to start thinking about immigration. I'll tell you why. I was born in the 50s in the baby boom. Now, I'm 64, right? And... I need people to pay my pension. And if you look at the demographics, also with this COVID thing, probably all the effects of it, there are fewer and fewer younger people supporting a larger and ageing population in Britain. Michael, we I understand the point about... I, I, I do understand that. I do understand that point. But, but yeah. it's the manner in which you, you, you grant those people the ability to come into the country. If you were just saying, right, we bring as many people in, they pay as much tax as they possibly can in order to pay for Michael's pension, no, no, then that's fine. But that does like have... That. Yeah, that, no, it doesn't. But that does have societal consequences. It's why some people say we, we can't take any more people. People said that in the 30s about Jewish people. They did. I mean, I was pulling up this bike. This is actually sort of kind of odd. I was pulling up um, a piece of lino in my kitchen about a year ago, and I found a, a Daily Mail from the 1930s, and there was an ad in it saying German refugees, refugees from Germany, are not coming to this country to steal your jobs. And it was, it was the, the ad was put in there by mm. the TUC and the World Council of Churches. Now, I don't think anybody makes a 2,000 mile journey hanging under a lorry because they think it's going to be a barrel of laughs. What's no, well, quite. And, and, and there is there is a degree, Michael, we have to leave it there only for time reasons, but it's interesting to get your thoughts having been to those camps. I, w I was in the jungle camp in Calais um, when it was still operational before it got bull bulldozed. And you can find a, a whole different type of uh, different people from all over the world coming for a variety of reasons. Some of those people said, yep, we're from, we're from Syria. They had the passports. They were trying to make the asylum claim. They said they got family in the UK and that's why they were there. And then there were some people who came from countries that you know, uh, were unsafe for them, had got to places like Italy. I remember one chap, he'd left his family in Pakistan, they were under threat from the Taliban, and he'd left the country and he'd gone through Europe and he got to Italy and made an asylum claim in Italy. The Italians had granted him and his family asylum uh, a home and a job. And this chap had decided, actually, I'm going to carry on and try and get into Britain. So he'd made the journey up through France and was now at Calais. And, do you know, it's so difficult, but if that were me... And if I'd run away from the Taliban in Pakistan and some country, uh, a safe country, Italy, had granted me the opportunity to bring my family over and a home and a job, 
I think I'd know what I'd do first, and it wouldn't be to go to Calais. 0345 6060 973, 1238 is the time. Let's turn to what's been going on in the United States over the last few hours. President Trump tweeting from his hospital uh, six, seven, eight hours or so ago, a video where he was saying, yeah, never been in better health, despite the fact that he's in hospital with coronavirus. Simon Marks joins us, LBC's Washington correspondent, uh, who's up and raring to go for another day of what presumably is going to be high drama. What can we expect, Simon? Good morning. Well, I think the outstanding question, good morning to you, Tom, is, is this going to be another day of absolute chaos here in Washington? Because yesterday certainly was. No straight story being put out by the White House. On the one hand, we had the president's physician assuring reporters that everything was absolutely fine. They were very pleased with the president's progress. Uh, he would not be drawn on whether the president had ever been given oxygen, but he simply insisted that he wasn't receiving it yesterday. We later learned that oxygen was administered to the president on Friday. Friday at the White House prior to his transfer to Walter Reed Hospital. But after the physician briefed reporters, then the White House Chief of Staff, in an off-the-record session, although we now absolutely can say that it was the White House Chief of Staff, Mark Meadows, told reporters that actually the situation was much more serious, that in the past 24 hours the President's oxygen levels had given grave cause, uh, cause for concern and that they were very worried about the 48 hours that lay ahead. Mark Meadows then warned walked those comments back publicly and listen to this from last night on the Fox News Channel where Mark Meadows, the Chief of Staff, goes on air to talk to Judge Janine Pirro for her Saturday night primetime show and he is clearly aware that President Trump is watching the programme and listening to what he says. Take a listen to this. Really, this this uh, this particular, uh, and, and I, I want to make sure I don't speak for the doctors, I've, I've actually, uh, right. Doc Conley is right next door to me and uh we just left the president right before uh he uh yeah uh uh actually he's probably tuned in right now uh watching watching you judge but i, I can tell you this the the biggest thing that we see is is that uh with a with no fever now and with him doing uh really well with his oxygen uh saturation levels we uh, yesterday uh, morning we were we were real concerned with that. So there was a problem that they never disclosed to the public, and when the president is listening in to what he has to say on television, he is very carefully measuring his words. As you know, Tom, we did see that video of the president last night—a four-minute video in which he insisted that he's feeling better and he can't wait to get back into the fray so he can continue the task of making America great again. But he has something very strange to say again about why he was ever admitted to the hospital in the first place. But I had no choice because I just didn't want to stay in the White House. I was given that alternative. Stay in the White House, lock yourself in, don't ever leave, don't even go to the Oval Office, just stay upstairs and enjoy it. Don't see people, don't talk to people and just be done with it. And I can't do that. I had to be out front and this is America. This is the United States. This is the greatest country in the world. This is the most powerful country in the world. I can't be locked up in a room upstairs and totally safe and uh, just say, hey, whatever happens, happens. I can't be locked up in isolation in the White House, so I'm going to get Marine One to swoop down onto the lawn <laughs> of the White House and take me uh, to one of the best resourced medical facilities in the country simply because I don't think I can do 14 days of isolation. I mean, you explain it to me because I have no idea what to make of any of this. Well, well there, there is... It's all deliberate, isn't it? There is something deliberate going on here about uh, countering the narrative coming from, or the, 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 the story coming from the hospital uh, with the president's chief of staff saying that it's not going that way at all. Um, and I just wonder why, that, as you wonder, Simon, why is that? Why, why is this, there being a, a, such a lack of, of clarity about the president's condition? Is it because a lack of clarity perhaps helps the president in his campaign that people might feel more sympathetic towards him if they know he's been really ill? Well, it may be that, and you can argue that the White House Chief of Staff, Mark Meadows, is actually rather carefully paving the way for the moment when President Trump emerges from Walter Reed Medical Center and goes back onto the campaign trail, the invincible gladiator, the man who got through something that was even worse than the public was told mm. it was. Uh, it, it, it was. Uh, but there's, I think, a slightly bigger issue here as well, which is the question of whether Donald Trump himself has in fact been a super spreader 
of COVID-19 over the last week. It's also worth making the point, by the way, that in that video, at no point does he tell Americans to wear face masks, not even referenced mm. in the video. Uh, but there is a lack of clarity, I think it's charitable to say, about the timeline. We don't know exactly when, definitively, because we can't trust the account from the White House. It's shifted on multiple occasions when Donald Trump tested positive. Was it, as his physician suggested yesterday in the morning, was it on Wednesday, or was it, as he later corrected the record to say, on Thursday? Either way, on Wednesday night, the president went and addressed a mask-free rally in Minnesota. On Thursday, definitely after they suspected that he might be COVID-19 positive, he pressed ahead and went to a fundraising event in New yeah. Jersey, mask-free, mixing with some very wealthy people there that he hoped were going to help prop up his campaign financially. I mean, on the face of it, all the way back to Saturday a week ago in that event at the White House where he introduced his Supreme Court judge, uh, justice nominee uh, to the American public, on the face of it, it's perfectly possible that Donald Trump has been spreading COVID-19 COVID-19 wherever he's gone, including that first debacle of a presidential debate in Cleveland. I think you've got a long, possibly very dramatic day <laughs> ahead of you, Simon, but to ever thus, thank you very much indeed for your time. Simon Marks, LBC's Washington correspondent, joining us live for the very latest on what it is we can actually make out has happened uh, when it comes to the president, his test, his uh, positivity of the virus, uh, and what actually his condition is in that military hospital. 0345 973 is my number if you want to come in and discuss the uh, debate that is going on, that has been going on for some time, about what to do about asylum seekers coming into this country, making a claim where they are going to live and what should be made of that claim, particularly when, and I didn't realise this was the case actually, additions to that claim can be made by lawyers at any point in that process. That seems to me to be very odd. If you're going to make a claim, you make it, there's the claim, you test it, and if it fails, it fails, if it's good, it's good. Why you can then keep adding to it at various points does seem to me to be odd and unfair. And perhaps it, it leads you to the conclusion that it's led Priti Patel to that the asylum system is broken. 0345 6060 973. More of your calls in just a moment. Tom Swarbrick here, 1245. Coming up at 12, Majid Noirs leading Britain's conversation. Next on LBC.
Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. Let's come straight to your calls on Pretty Patel's plans for a new asylum system. Sheba is in West Norwood this hour. Hi, Sheba. Hello, hello, Tom. Hi. Yes, um, I, I, hello, hello. <coughs> um, yeah, basically, I just think that um, if you're here illegally, you shouldn't be. Yeah? You should not be here illegally. I mean, I was listening to you whereby you were saying, like, well, there was an example, for instance, that man from Pakistan, yeah? Mm-hmm. He landed in Italy, yeah? He was given citizenship. He was given housing. He was given an opportunity many of the citizens in that country couldn't get, can't get, looking for. Yet he rejected that in his bid to get here. Come on. What's the that about? Are you serious? Well, look, I, I, what is I, it about I, I here? Agree. You have to get here. I agree. What is it about I, here? Well, I think, I think the judgment was made when I spoke to this chap, this is several years ago now, Shabba, but the judgment was made when I spoke to this chap that it would be better in Britain than in, than in Italy. Now, he's allowed to come to that conclusion if he wants. He's a, he, can, he can try. Personally, uh, you know, I don't know what other pressures were on this man, but personally, if it was just about getting my family out of that part of ta- Pakistan because I was under threat from the Taliban, I'd take anywhere that gave me a home that was safe. Absolutely. You know, from the terror, I'll be fleeing from these countries. By the grace of God, I land in one of these countries that can help me. And they're actually offering me citizenship and everything else. Yeah? What, what's Britain? Why, why do they have to come here? What is the need that they have but we, to we, come so, here? So let's, let's say, Shiv, so let's, you know, if people want to come here and they're going to try and get here, then that's, they're going to try and do it. We can't, we can't uh, push the thought out of their head that they don't want to come here anymore. Do you think it should be impossible for somebody, even if they are legally uh, allowed to live in this country, if they go through illegal methods to get here, that they shouldn't be allowed to have that claim heard or processed? Absolutely. I think if they found illegal ways, like you said, I heard, I was listening to Ian, I think, the other day, where if they, there's, there's a way that they can actually approach the British, the British embassy in the, in the countries that they come from. Yeah, where they can claim asylum through those methods. Yeah, where an assessment would be made. Yeah, if they pass the test, then the doors open. Yeah. All right. This well, there, there are programs that exist. Yeah, there are programs that exist for people to claim asylum in country um, to the United Kingdom. But those, those, that some of those programs have been um, shut down, or the numbers of people taken from those programs by the United Kingdom has been uh, lower than other countries. Um, I just wonder if if it's if it's if we're judging the person against the claim that they are making rather than the method of entry. If we just push people out, even though they've got a legal right to be here because they came in on the back of a truck, that's our fault, isn't it, for for letting the truck get in with a person on the back of it? Yeah, but they got in. All right, fine. Let's say let's say for instance, I am trying to get in. I want to get in because I know Britain is the place that I have got friends, people I know. I'll mm-hmm. do whatever it takes to get to Britain. Then what I would expect is to claim to put asylum to, 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 to claim asylum here. I will say, well, yeah, I've got friends. I have to prove the fact that I have got friends. I've got to have people in Britain to actually accept me as their members. Yeah. Okay, first and foremost, I've got to actually prove that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Secondly, I'm here. I, 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 uh, the, 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 what am I running away from? What am I running well, away it depend, from? It depend, so, so that that is going to depend on from, on the. Go on. Let's say, like, let's say, for instance, like, I'm I'm running away from Syria. Oh, it's awful there. It's hell. It's hell on earth. Nobody wants to live under those circumstances. Yeah, all right? Um, I'm scared. Yeah, Italy, yeah, whatever. I just want to get to that family. You've got to have people there really looking to see whether this person really should... Oh, okay. That, no, I agree. That. I agree. Let's, so let's let's make sure. Proved. Sorry, Sheba. Sorry, Sheba. I just I, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on from your call only because yeah, more people yeah. want to get yeah, on. Sorry, Tom, but thank sorry, you for. Yeah. I appre- no, it's all right. I appreciate your your time. But the the um, the, where these things are processed, who processes those claims, and in in what time frame? And then, of course, the question is: Well, if they're in this country and they've had a uh, a claim turned down, what happens? And that's that's where Priti Patel is is seemingly most um, agitated because there have been various flights that have been taking people out of the country who have had their claim fail, and lawyers have got involved, and those people have been taken off those flights. Um, Sheba, thank you. Here's Dinesh in Oxford. Hi, Dinesh. 
Uh, hi, good afternoon, Tom. Uh, hi, thanks hi. for uh, putting me on the on the on the show. Um, I would say tougher is the best answer because people are getting to the channel before they get to the channel. They're coming to at least five or six countries, and why don't they apply? As a migrant myself, well, they can't. They can't to... apply for asylum in Britain in those countries. No, they don't have to. They can apply to the country they're landing in. They just want a better sure, life. But, it, but, more, more but more. why? Why is it fair to? Italy or to um, Greece to say, well, you have to take all the people because you're the first country that they come to. How's that fair? Well, it's it's not fair because it's not a matter of choice for the people who are coming in. They're anywhere apart from the country is a better choice. And I don't see why why can't they just go and apply in another country where they're landing. It's purely built on people smuggling. And unless there's a strong message sent, there's no way we can break the chain. I feel for the people. I don't know that it's. I don't know, Dinesh, that it is purely based on people smuggling. Absolutely plays a huge part in this, no doubt. Mm. But I, I don't know that it. I mean, can you imagine being having this conversation in in Greece or in Athens somewhere, where where the 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 presumption is then okay? Well, everybody that lands in Greece has to stay in Greece. No one else is going to take the people, and and actually they all want to be there because Greece is much safer than where they've come from. You'd be up in arms. Well, I understand that. So maybe you have a clearinghouse in Greece where there's an equal shift between the countries, including countries like Switzerland, who get away with having a xenophobic culture. Well, this is, Dinesh, thank you. This is where um, the European Union were trying to answer that question about exactly how they, how people are split out um, around the European Union. And there was huge argument from a lot of the uh, member states of the European Union about, about the numbers that were given. Thank you for the call. George is in Dartford. Hiya, George. Hi, good morning, Tom. Sir? Hi. Um, as a linguist, I got to see a little bit of the immigration um, system and appeals process uh, from the inside. I worked initially for refugees organizations whilst I was at university, then uh, home office, then the appeal courts, then the police. Oh, so wow. I, okay. I, I got to see um, a, a bit of what goes on. And, uh, the level and what's, it like it, what's it like in there? <laughs> Tom... There is such a level of abuse that I, I, I got quite disheartened with the whole thing and I stopped doing that l line of work because I just could not see, I could not do it and remain par uh, impartial. Mm. And uh, it's the level of abuse, what you've been talking about. Give, you know, give, me, give me an example, George. Give me an example of the kind of abuse that you would see of the system. Uh, one was quite corrupt um solicitors in this country that verse the the applicants on what they've got to say uh that was well known back in the 90s and i don't think it has changed since then um so-called refugees uh, coming to this country knowing knowing the system bet better than you and me what bu buttons to press and what they've got to say and and what's a joke as well tom is the the burden of proof proof it's impossible to prove that uh, what these people are saying is not the truth. So it, it is a system that's open to abuse. It is abuse. Back in the 90s when I was doing it, the backlog at the Home Office was, a, a, I think, 130,000 or thereabouts. Yeah. And uh, since then, there have been many um, amnesties under different guises, different rules, the seven-year rule, the eight-year rule. And, uh, you know, then the European... Um, human rights and uh yeah. you know george it's interesting it's interesting that you i mean it, it sounds to me like um almost inherently as you say how, how do you prove somebody's case if they're saying oh, i've come from this country they've got no documentation on them that is that is making it really really hard and i guess where the presumption of um rejection if you've landed here on a boat or you've got in on a truck maybe that that creates at least a I know, a fairer system from, for those people who are applying from elsewhere. Thank you for the call. Um, PT is a new caller in Newbury. Hi, PT. Hey, how are you? I'm very well, sir. I'm afraid you've got about a minute. No, that's fine. Long, first time caller, long time listener. I just want to make the, the point show. we're not addressing the root causes here of economic opportunity and the ultimate problems. Along with that, why, why can't we just agree as society that we have to obey the law and if we want the, the law changed, if we do the necessary things to make the law change. I don't, I don't understand. If, if there's illegal immigrants, they're illegal, right? Mm -hmm. I think we should help asylum seekers 100%. I think that immigration is good country, but the law has to start 
with being enforced, and then we have to make the changes necessary. We have to have quotas on asylum. We have to have maybe net immigration. Look, you could tell by my accent, maybe. I- I'm happy to be here. I well, have we to had, we had to be fair, PT, sorry to interrupt, but we had a, a, a no. target of immigration down to the tens of thousands, but that seems to have been ditched now. Well, but I'm saying it shouldn't be, is my point. We, we should have targets for asylum. Look, at, is it fair that Italy and Greece would have to take all these people? Absolutely not. But then there has no. to be an agreement with the countries, which no one's Well, this is where, I mean, BT, I, I, w- I would, sorry that it's so short, but I, if you could get into the uh, Justice Lipsius building in the EU and clang some heads together about this, because this is a problem that they haven't been able to solve for a long time. Listen, thank you so much for your call. Thank you for all your calls on the programme uh, this morning and this afternoon. I'm back with you Monday night at 10pm on LBC, Monday at 10pm. Uh, Swarbrick on Sunday, back on Sunday at 10. Uh, the Global Player is available for you to download if you missed any of the programme, or indeed you want to go back and listen to others or download podcasts to coming up at four it's ian payne now on lbc majid nawaz thank you tom coming up migrants who board boats to cross the channel or come to britain via other illegal routes will be routinely denied asylum under new laws to be unveiled today by pretty patel what should the future of our migration policy look like before that a leading private girls school is giving regular blood tests to its pupils who decide to